Hello. Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to ODI Leeds. Can everyone hear? Yeah. Very good. Um, welcome to ODI Leeds. Um, hopefully, um, hello. Hello. Very good. Uh, my name is Paul Connell, um, and you, you are all very welcome. There's a few bit of housekeeping things we need to do before we start. Um, if you need tea or coffee, just help yourself. You've all found that already. The loos are just next to the lifts. Um, we don't have any planned fire alarms today. If there is a fire, follow me out of that door um, or follow the team through the corridor all the way to the end, down the stairs, and meet in front of Agra. Um, there are some seats down the front, Adrian and Sid, if you'd like to join oh. us. That's, that's very good. Or we can get you some seats to sit at the back like the cool kids, if that's, that's okay. Um, we've got a really uh, fascinating two days working with um, IoT UK, um, part of Digital Catapult today. So they're over here. Catherine, where are you? Over here. Um, if you'd like to join me at the front and just give us two minutes on that. Um, if you want to find out about ODI Leeds, just look on the web, odileads.org. Um, everything we do is on there. Um, you might see the hashtag on the back. We are radically open, so everything we do is on there. If you want to find out about us, that's the place to do it. Today, um, uh, we've got two days of work around IoT. Uh, today, the first bit is the IoT showcase. So we've got about 10 folk giving us short presentations about the cool stuff that they're doing with IoT. Um, in Leeds, in Yorkshire, around the world, um, all the different parts of the IoT spectrum. A um, little bit of a radio gag there. But um, if you want to um, find out about this, we'll be live streaming. If you really don't want to be on a live stream, let one of the people with an ODI Leeds t-shirt on. We'll give you a little sticker and we'll do our best to make sure you're not on the live stream. So if that worries you, um, uh, just let us, let us know. So. Um, Catherine, if you just do two minutes on uh, why you are supporting this and what you're doing, come and join me on the rug of truth. Hello. Oh, nice. Um, okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's IoT UK Challenger North. Um, so, just to, to give me an idea, who's heard of Digital Catapult before? Okay, good. Um, so for those of you who haven't, I'll just do a quick intro to Digital Catapult. Um, we are the UK's leading technology and innovation centre, and we basically exist to help with the adoption of emerging technologies. We focus on three main areas, so artificial intelligence, um, immersive technologies, and future networks, including IoT. Um, and we run kind of events like this um, all over the country. And if you are interested, just take a look on our website. There's kind of a get involved section with all of our open calls. And we run things like investor breakfast, um, hack and pitches, pit stops, whole load of different things. So if you're interested, just have a look on the website. We are really looking forward to the next two days. Wish you all luck. And I can't wait to see who gets crowned the winner at the end of the two days. Thank you. So this morning is the, um, these, are, these are all the partners that are involved, just so you know. This morning is the, the showcase, so we've got the agenda here. We've got a live stream. You share this link with anyone you want. Everything that comes out of today and also the Challenger event will be on this one web page, so you can find out all about it. And I'm going to ask Adam Beaumont to kick off, if I can find the slides. You changed your slide this morning, didn't you? Good. So, um, Adam Beaumont, AQL, needs no introduction. Introduce yourself and away you go. Thanks very much. The live stream starts now. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so, so as, uh, as Paul mentioned, I did change the subject at the last minute, and this is because this is an IoT showcase. I was going to talk more about the cyber challenges of IoT because I'm a cyber person, 
Um, but I thought I'd actually bring you something real because real is better. Um, so for those that were expecting something on um, why private IoT rather than IoT, um, what I was going to talk to you about there is, is the fact that you're increasing your, your exposure surface, um, the number of threat vectors by deploying lots and lots of remote connected devices connected to the internet. And one of the things that, that my main company does is we provide mobile wall gardens. So we can connect things to things remotely and they can't talk to the internet, only to your mothership application. And we were trying to find a good name for sort of that, that secure IoT space. Um, secure network of things, snot, doesn't quite work. Um, so we, we, set, we settled on private internet of things. Um, but what I want to talk to you about today uh, was something that's a little, it's a little bit closer to my heart, uh, which stems from sailing. Um, so uh, we've been going for nearly 20 years. I think there's a birthday party coming up soon. And one of the things that me and a number of the team enjoy is getting out on the water. And what that's led to is the folks that organize all the sailing regattas deciding to empty our pockets. So we've become sponsors. And so we sponsor grassroots sailing. Um, so like this class here is called the Squib, massive community sailing class, um, stuff going off into the distance. One of the things that, that community sailors are really interested in is, is how to build an ecosystem, how to bring people in and infuse people and, and, and to also align them with their values. And they're, they're very much about accessibility, but also sustainable sailing. How can we make it cheaper? Uh, how can we also lower our impact? And so one of the things that we decided to do this year at the largest sailing regatta uh, in the UK, well, it's the largest sailing regatta in the, w regatta in the world, it's uh, Cow's Week. So um, over 8,000 participants, 1,700 boats. Is we thought, let's do a bit of a social experiment. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to try and do was drive down the use of plastic single-use bottles at Cow's Week. And there was 8,000 competitors, and we thought, if we buy them 8,000 of these, which we did, what happens? Do people use them? Um, can we drive a new normal? And we thought, well, we could probably get the data to actually make this happen. So, so one of the things that I did was I challenged my team. Could we create some sensors to, to measure behavior? And so they said, I'm sure we can. And so we decided to call the project Sensing Change. And we thought we'd call it Sensing Change be because we can't, we can't monitor everything. Um, whilst we can monitor some things quantitatively, um, we can't monitor societal change. You can monitor little bits of it and use it as an indicator. So what we decided to do was work out what the uptake of, of these reusable bottles are. So we, did, we decided to install some sensors. So we installed a low power wide area network uh, across the entire of cows, which is not that difficult to do, as you know. It's back called over our 4G network into our data centers. And I challenged one of my most junior members of staff. He's an intern. Um, and because I, I wanted this done quickly and I wanted it done by my sort of skunk works team. And I didn't want it to impinge on the day to day work. I just wanted to see if, if, if I could empower somebody to do a project end to end. And they gave them very little brief other than we wanted, we wanted to monitor positive behavior and to log it over time. So he came up with this. Now, Curtis isn't here today, um, but we're gonna send a little video around that Curtis has recorded over the next few days where we can get him in front of a camera. Um, and this is basically, it's an Arduino board and a few other little things in a nice little 3D printed box. So he's turned it into a finished product, or it looks like a finished product. And an array of sensors that you can connect to it. So this one is a water flow sensor. So those of you who, who do plumbing, you know that that fits on a 15 mil pipe on some normal standard couplers, and you can, you can plumb it into a water fountain or a refill tap. So that's what we did. And we deployed a load of those around, around cows at public refill taps. And we partnered with the refill campaign, if any of you heard of it. Um, so refill, uh, brilliant. So fantastic. Fantastic. So um, one of my other hats is, um, is I'm a trustee of the Eden Project in Cornwall. And Refill came out of a bit of a think tank and a few ideas from the Eden Project. And Natalie then spun that out into what is now a global campaign. And it's absolutely brilliant because we're all a little bit too polite as Brits. And what we don't want to do is, is get a freebie. So the idea of going into a coffee shop and saying, I don't want to buy a bottle of water. Will you fill my bottle up? 
uh, is something that we do not do. So refill is a way of saying, you're safe to do this and nobody's gonna bite you or shout at you. Uh, and these are the places where you can, you can happily refill your bottle and, no, and nobody's gonna be upset. So we rolled this out across cows and what was interesting was, was on the streets, people carrying the bottles, it became the new normal because we'd actually managed to penetrate a community in su to such an extent that nobody wanted to carry a plastic bottle because they're, the, they're then the odd one out. And what we saw was these huge queues um, for the taps. So what we know is we didn't have enough taps. Um, but of the taps that we monitored, um, over, the course of, over the course of Cow's Week, we dispensed from each tap around 3,000 litres of water. So if you look at that as... 500 ml bottles, doesn't take much to do the math, that's 6,000 bottles of refill per tap. Um, and this is, the, this is the bit where sensing change becomes qualitative rather than quantitative, because obviously you can extrapolate that in your mind's eye over the number of taps. But we don't, so we don't know the exact amount, but we do know that we're seeing positive behaviour. So this project is about sensing change over time. So we're leaving this running this year, next year, the year after. And I'm hoping as a sponsor, we can also guilt people a little bit into saying, please don't expect us to buy you a new aluminium bottle next year because 8,000 aluminium bottles was really expensive. So next year, we're only going to make 2,000 aluminium bottles and we expect everybody to bring the other ones. The other part of this project was we also built some little ultrasonic sensors that go into plastic recycling bins, the ones that you put your plastic bottle in. So we've been logging the data as to how many plastic bottles are being thrown away in representative locations. We're going to keep those representative locations. And we've been uh, mapping how much, how much refilling is being done. And this started off as, a, as, a, as, a, as an, um, an intern project. And now we're rolling them out in the drinking fountains around Leeds. Uh, we've rolled them out at the Eden Project. We've rolled them out at the Lost Gardens of Heligan. And it's starting to become an actual product um, but this, is, this has all come from an idea sort of enabled at quite a low level within our company um, to support the monitoring of positive change. So, so whilst you can use IoT for all manner of business flow processes, um, for monitoring um, the security of things, monitoring um, uh, footfall, monitoring traffic flow, um, you can also use them uh, for monitoring changes in positive societal behaviour. Um, so this, this is a little project that we've pulled together. And I just wanted to kind of share it with you. If you want to look online, there's a page. It's not, it's not a great URL. Uh, it's sensingchange.aql.com forward slash cows for the taps in cows. Um, and you, you'll see there's a, there's a gentle baseline at the moment of, of refilling going on from, from, the, from the taps there. But what we're going to monitor is over the years, can we drive positive change and actually reinforce that message with a well done uh, by showing society the data to show that we're actually heading in the right direction. So that's all I wanted to say about IoT. It can be used for good stuff. So thanks for listening and uh, enjoy the day. We've got time for two questions. Anyone got a question for Adam? There's one there. And is there any other questions? You got away with it, Adam. One question. Just wait. Hi, Adam. Neil McClure, Head of Transport Innovation at ODI Leeds. Hi, Neil. Um, uh, I wanted to know um, your thoughts on whether there are applica potential applications for this type of thing in transport, particularly thinking about changing um, behavioural change or changing user, uh, changing user behaviours in, in transport? So I, th I think there's, there's some huge opportunities. And, um, so let, let's, start with, let's start with some of the kind of the more um, fixed use cases around transport. So, so if you look at um, the opportunities around um, uh, rail, for example, the, the York uh, leads... Manchester Transpennine Railway section uh, is about to be fibred up. So we're involved in that project. Um, and this is to super connect the trains, the platforms, and everything in between. Part of that's to serve content, um, but part of that is to get telemetry data from the trains. Uh, and the idea is that we're going to be slicing up um, the network 
to the trains for different things. So whether that's being able to watch Netflix better uh, or be able, to, be able to browse Wi-Fi better or get telemetry from the trains. But there's other slices that could be used for other projects. So if you were wanting to put in place something which uh, drove positive change on the train, you could, you could actually work uh, with us and other partners to actually uh, create a platform that could be connected to all those, all those vehicles. Um, we see similar opportunities um, uh, on, in, in road as well as we start to roll out 5G. Um, there's going to be dedicated channels for telemetry. Uh, the, the way to sort of get into that um, ecosystem is, is to talk to us, is to, is to message me at the moment because it's, it's early phase, we're pulling together the infrastructure and as we get the infrastructure in place, then we start to work with partners to build the layers on top of it. So we, we're gonna do the dumb stuff and the plumbing, so that those, that those lines are gonna land into our data centers. We then want to work with clever software platforms and clever software developers that say, ah, I see an opportunity to connect to stuff on a train and I'd like to do this. And that's the bit that we can help unlock. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, Chris Meller, where are you? Yeah, Chris is over there. So um, you just mentioned, mentioned finding partners, friends, people to do business with, uh, work on projects. <clears throat> I just did a quick poll around pe why people are here today. About half the people mentioned the same thing. So Chris is here from AQL today. If you want to speak to someone who can create a network and support that sort of thing, AQL are in the room. And part of the job at VAWAS today is to make sure that people make friends and do more with uh, what they're doing and find some partners to, to work with. So thanks, Adam. I know you've got to go, but it's been really good to see yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. So next up is John Polling. Where are you, John? He's over here. Amy's going to sort out your slides. So Amy will get your slides up. You introduce yourself yeah. and over to you. Morning, everyone. Hope you can hear me all right. I've never done a presentation with a microphone before, so this will be different. Um, so this is actually a presentation I gave a few months ago at a Leeds IoT meetup event. Um, it was a bad night for giving a presentation because it was uh, England's opening game at the World Cup. So there were about eight of us there, I think. Um, <coughs> so And plus that talk was about half an hour long. So uh, I've had to really, really heavily compress and miss out all the funny bits. Um, so very quickly, my name is John Polling. I'm from a company based in uh, C4DI in Hull. Uh, called Source. Um, we're based along, along what's now sort of affectionately known as the IoT corridor in uh, in Hull, in, sorry, in C4DI, and we uh, build web and mobile applications and IoT, IoT systems for our clients. Um, and the particular client I want to look at today um, is a very traditional manufacturing business called Ideal Boilers. So they're around 100 years old as a business. Uh, they're one of the biggest boiler manufacturers in the UK. Uh, I think the second or third, it kind of fluctuates. If you're interested, the, f the biggest boiler manufacturer in the UK is actually Worcester Boilers, and they, they are that size because they own the British gas contract. So whoever owns that contract is the biggest boiler manufacturer. Um, Ideal Boilers do both domestic and commercial heating as well. Um, Ideal actually came to us when we were about three or four months old as a business, and what they wanted, and they took a bit of a punt on us to be honest, but what they wanted was a smart heating system um, and all the usual sort of bells and whistles that you would expect from that. So they wanted a mobile app to control their boilers, um, and they also wanted to collect an awful lot of data from their boilers as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about data collection today because there's an awful lot of data coming out of those boilers, and the talk's too long to be honest. Um, what I want to talk about today is really what it's like for a company, a traditional manufacturing business, to get into software devel development. Um, they're the right side of the fence, in my opinion, for kind of getting into IoT rather than a software team trying to get into manufacturing. Um, so it was nice to get involved in this project. Um, Ideal have their whole manufacturing process very, very well drilled. They're hugely successful at building uh, boilers. Um, They've got an incredibly well-established sort of internal set of processes to go from an idea to a boiler. Um, they've got great testing facilities, so they have they do environmental testing on all their components, um, and then they have kind of full testing process around fully built boil, uh, boilers as well. They've also got some great aftercare processes, so they've obviously got support, customer support, and a whole warranty process. 
Um, a really, really rough slide on their kind of process. Clearly, there's a lot more to it than that. But um, when they're building a boiler, they obviously go for a research process. They uh, create their spec for it. They choose scoff and choose suppliers for all the various components. They then build it, test it, put it out to field trial <coughs> with sort of 30, 40 different people. And once they've gone through that process and happy with their boiler, they then release it to the distributors to actually go and install these things with the customers. Um, the last two boxes are in green because that's really only where the customers kind of get involved from an a ideal point of view. And I kind of want, I'll come back to this slide in a minute to kind of show what the difference is now for them. Um, for ideal as well, they're their relationship with the customer kind of ends after warranty as well. So there's no sort of, you've got maybe a five year warranty period and it kind of comes to the end of that uh, and that's it. Uh, they don't really kind of worry about the customers too much after that because if your boiler breaks after that, you're gonna contact an engineer and they'll deal with it. Um, they do have a really surprisingly small budget set aside as well for repairs and warranty, which kind of underlines how good their process is at building. It's surprisingly small. It's kind of tens of thousands rather than hundreds of thousands. And when you think, they're selling hundreds of thousands of boilers. That's a surprising number. Um, and the other benefit for the other good thing for Ideal is boilers have a really well-defined boundary. It kind of sits in the wall and it heats your house, and that's kind of it, really, on a realistic point of view. Yeah, you, your gas might get cut off, but there aren't too many things that are going to affect that boiler for the next 25 years. So, what's it like for a company like Ideal, who have done this process years and for a long time, launching a software project? Um, well, this is the one phrase we had in our meetings all the time with them. And that was, once you launch this, you can't get off. It's not like you're just going to go and stick your boiler on the wall and that's it, and you can move on to the next project. This is an ongoing thing for the next kind of 25 plus years of the lifetime of this boiler. And we reiterated that all the time. So, so running back to that original slide, I've got a nice big red box now which says the world keeps changing. Um, yes, it does from, an, from a boiler point of view, but it's not connected to the internet, so nothing affects it. And now they've got this boiler sat on a wall connected to the internet, everything affects it. Um, so we had this, what we would call the post-launch problem. Obviously, boilers last a long time, you know, 20 plus years. Those smart heating devices need to be supported through that time as well. Um, we've got servers that now need maintaining, upgrading, iOS updates, browser updates happen all the time outside of the control of Ideal, which is horrified them when they first realized they were going to have to worry about things like that. Um, <coughs> there's lots of new IoT services coming out all the time. Obviously, we've had all the usual stuff, Alexa, Google Home, etc. But there's going to be more and more and more and more of these things, and people are going to want these things to talk to their heating systems. Um, again, all completely outside the control of Ideal. So they've gone from a really controlled environment to something that they can't control. Um, we had lots of third-party things. Uh, so we've got email servers. Uh, push notification stuff, all these were kind of third party things you would expect, even down to just having a weather feed where we push the external weather down to those boilers so they can work more efficiently. Um, those services are going to update, they may even stop, so there's all these things are going to affect them, the things that they just didn't have affecting them before. Even things like now we have GDPR, which is a big change for them. Um, consumer expectations, consumers are a nightmare. Um, Expectations on a boiler are relatively low. It should heat my house, it should come on at set times, I should be able to boost it, it should heat my water, etc. But as soon as you start connecting it to the internet, things change a lot. Um, expectations on software are high. People expect updates to their software for free most of the time. People don't want to pay for updates, probably don't want to pay for your software, to be honest. Um, they want, obviously, all the bug fixes happening. Um, I haven't got time to talk about bug fixes because the reliability team at Ideal were expecting to ship with absolutely none um, ever. Uh, that's a talk in itself as well. Um, and obviously, consumers, consumers expect that any new smart device should talk to your uh, existing smart devices. Um, they expect way more control. I mean, in the good old days, boilers came on, you set, it, you set a schedule and they went off. And that was it. And if you were left the house, you'd have to manually go and turn it off. Now, with a connected device, you leave the house, the boiler should know you've left, and uh, it should switch itself off or at least turn the temperature down. Um, you should get reports and things like boiler faults. So, ex you know, people weren't expecting this kind of thing five, six years ago. Um, they expect, because it's called smart, that it should save them money. 
Um, <clears throat> they expect that um, they should be able to go and look at all their data, what their data looked like six months ago on a boiler. What was my boiler doing six months ago? Apparently, people would like to know that kind of thing. Again, things they just would never have worried about when they didn't have a connected boiler. Um, it should be able to tell the, the consumer if their boiler is unwell. You know, if they're about to go away on holiday, they want to know if their boiler is going to break halfway through their holiday. Uh, and they obviously expect things to work offline. Two minutes, I'm getting there. Two slides. Um, so they, the testing process changed dramatically as well for, uh, for Ideal. Um, they had a very set testing process, as I always mentioned. Um, but now they have an IoT platform that gets regular updates. They need to know that those connected devices work all the time. Um, those platform updates happen outside of their control. You've obviously got mobile, as I said, mobile updates, other third-party updates. So contesting has come from being kind of a pre-selling point uh, thing to an ongoing process now for 20, 25 years. Um, so that's a really big, big difference for them as well. Um, so just very quickly, conclusion. Um, manufacturing businesses obviously have their processes nailed, um, but it's a completely different world once you've got a connected device. Um, you have all the stuff of post-launch that is going to affect you. And consumers have really high expectations of your systems once you connect them with software as well. Um, and obviously, things are just going to constantly keep changing. So, so for someone like e Ideal, they have now have, instead of just having a few IT people running this project, they've got a whole IoT team uh, running the whole project now. So that's me. Hopefully, that's 10 minutes. Amazing. That, that, that's a fascinating talk and just how much the, uh, the world of software is smashing into uh, the world of manufacturing, all, all of the sectors as well. So um, has anyone got a question for John? Great. We've got two questions. Any more questions? We've got three questions. So we'll take those three questions. Neil's got a... If you just say who you are and where you're from and your question. Hello, Neil, ba Neil Bartram, North Yorkshire County Council. Um, it's just a question about commercial confidentiality, stroke secrecy. Clearly, you mentioned Worcester Bosch out there. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if they weren't doing a similar program. Uh, how are you yeah. managing to keep your developments and initiatives private and confidential from whatever they might be doing? Uh, we, we don't do any work with Worcester, so that's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, all the stuff we've done, it's a closed um, IoT cloud platform that we've used for this particular project. Um, there, there are future projects going on with Ideal, which would be a different setup that we're working with. Um, but yeah, no, we just keep it all in-house, really. We've got lots of NDA signed, et cetera, so we can only talk about certain things. I think there was another one down here. Was that another question? No. Hi, Alistair Retty from Pinnacle Solutions. Um, what was the key driver that led them to take you on to do this project, and did it change? Because it sounds like there's a lot of pain that they didn't realize would be involved with this project? Yeah, when they first came to us, it was, they just wanted a mobile application building that, to work with their platform. Um, mm -hmm. And we soon realized, actually, that whilst the platform was good, um, it was a very generic platform, and it wasn't, there would needs to be a lot of boiler-specific stuff written into it. So we actually wrote, we basically augmented the platform and wrote a, another cloud layer around it. Um, and, and from there, we kind of start doing things like dragging all the data out, thousands or well, millions of lines of data out of these boilers and putting that away for da later data analysis so they can add machine learning and things like that into it. Um, so the driver was they knew they needed to get into this space very quickly because uh, all the competitors were doing it as well. Um, and they knew they could actually learn a heck of a lot about their boilers out in the wild by collecting all this data. That was probably the key, key thing. Okay, we've got one more question over here. Uh, Nick Code, do you wanna, you're next up, so do you want to join us so we get a smooth transition? Hi there. Um, I'm Adam Crampton, head of m at Leeds City Council and a, and a former gas engineer. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the smart technology, particularly in domestic boilers, is really immature still, and I think everyone's still doing largely the same thing amongst the manufacturers. We're interested in what, what's next, how do we make it more accessible, particularly for the low income domestic customers? Um, there's certain things I can't talk about, um, obviously. Um, but there are things going on where, obviously, um, I could probably chat with you later, actually, about okay. it, if that's all right. It'd probably be easier. But there are, there are things going on for sort of social housing, et cetera, um, and landlords, ex et cetera, as well. well. I'll just pick it up outside, yeah? Yeah, if that's all right, please. Thank you. Perfect. 
So I think we've we've got a win there. We've got someone making some new friends and someone finding a solution. Great. Um, round of applause for John. Uh, I, I, I love that talk because it's it's just really real and it's about people doing stuff rather than talking about doing stuff. Nick is going to show us a video. I think the sound's working. <laughs> yeah. So um, over to Nick. Nick, just introduce yourself and then give us your talk. Thanks very much. So uh, my name's Nick Code. I'm here today on behalf of uh, Urban Control. So Urban Control is um, a fairly new business. It would call itself a smart cities business. Its, um, its origins were it was spun out by a street lighting company who, having successfully connected street lights in some smart city demonstration projects in Glasgow and Bristol and London, quickly figured out that this IoT thing was a very different skill set to manufacturing um, uh, street lights. And in the space of two years, we've gone from um, uh, zero to 80,000 connected street lights already and on a, on a very quick trajectory to, uh, to, to double that. Um, I won't say uh, too much more, but my purpose here today really is I'm just really interested in um, connecting up with anyone else who might want to piggyback on our um, wireless network and connectivity. So I think the sort of smart cities uh, constantly needs to, to look at really compelling use cases and other sensors. Um, we do do some manufacture and development of sensors ourselves, so uh, things like the bin sensor and ba basic sensors that in most cases we would integrate with, um, with other sensors. So um, I'm going to play you a short video of one of the large innovation competitions that we've won recently. Um, this is sitting more in the transport space. We've got another one, but um, hopefully it will give you some thought for some questions. So uh, the background to this competition that we won, I should just say, was, was overcrowding um, and, and passenger f in, the, in the UK managing passengers through stations is um, it's a massive burden, so it's, it's a massive constraint, um, and it's costing, the, the industry reckons it's costing about 258 million a year, exceedingly difficult to tackle. What we know from the science is that signs are a really bad way of telling people where to go. I'm always really conscious when I go on the underground that I stand and hold everyone up because even though I know where the sign will be because most stations are the same, it still takes you a while to process it. So um, we're working with, and it perhaps picks up on the, the theme of the AQL presentation here. It's not just about technology or lights or IoT. Actually, what's really important here is understanding how people behave, yet behave and respond in this instance to light, but it could be to sound, it could be to signage, yep. Um, and actually using sensors both to inform a behavioral framework you've got and then, and then update it. So um, that's probably um, enough 
from me. I don't know if anyone has any questions or any thoughts. Um, I'm going to be around um, for the morning, um, but not any longer. So if anyone has any thoughts or questions or um, would like to, 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 to pitch um, their, their census to it, it'd be great to, to speak to you. So has anyone got any questions for Nick? I'm fascinated by this, how we're going to stop looking at signs thing, but um, <laughs> how, how that would work and yeah. Um, so uh, is there any questions? So have you any, done any questions on the, how people absorb information and process it? Is that the innovation, um, innovation you're looking at? Yeah, so um, what we know is, and, and the academics would talk it'd be about the principle of affordance, so it's actually if you, it's difficult but, but your, um, the function of a chair, the shape of it means that you don't have to be taught how to sit on the chair. It's fairly obvious how you would use it. Um, and we have this very innate response to color and light and shade, and it's how we, we can use that. So we have, there is a body of academic evidence about some of these things. It's very complicated, but that gives us an idea of what to aim for. And then what we will do with um, sensing technology which will allow us to val validate that and, and measure the effectiveness of it. So um, I think for me, the, um, the really clever thing that IoT allows you to do it is, is, is properly understand how different in interventions do work with behaviors and things. Wow, so your point around what's next is, <laughs> is we're going from a, a mobile app for a boiler to how our brains work and understand how a chair works. So that, that's amazing. So thanks very much, Nick. He's going on our day. Adrian's up next. You can do the introductions while we sort your slides out. Okay. Move that way so we get your Yeah, lovely. Good morning, everybody. My name's Adrian Marks, and I'm delighted to talk to you this morning about IOTA, a distributed ledger technology that's very much focused on the Internet of Things. Um, can I just ask, has, uh, who's heard of IOTA? Is anybody here aware of it? Two or three hands, but not many. Okay, hopefully a few more by the end of this session. Um, is there a clicker here I can use? That'll help. Lovely. Right, before I talk in depth about IOTA, um, I just want to kind of position where um, IOTA is in terms of the problem it's trying to solve um, regarding the machine-to-machine -machine economy. Um, hopefully, given the um, theme of this event, I'm kind of hoping most people subscribe to a future that involves many more devices attached to the internet and those devices very much into communicating with one another to build a machine-to-machine -machine economy. Certainly, I believe there are a lot of benefits to that and hopefully that's something for, for the future. Um, but as that develops, I think the one thing that's needed is a trusted data sharing and payment mechanism. And by that, I mean a digital payment mechanism. And for people who don't know much about distributed ledger technology, that's basically what um, a distributed ledger uh, provides. It provides data sharing, and it can also provide a payment mechanism. Uh, but what's important in this, though, is that that mechanism provides integrity of the data, security, but also efficiency and scalability. Now, most people have heard of blockchain. That's one distributed ledger technology, and that certainly can provide the first of those two characteristics. The challenge is it's been found to be somewhat limited when it comes to energy efficiency and scalability. So let's talk about IOTA. <coughs> IOTA is a second generation distributed ledger technology. It's not based on the blockchain structure. Sorry, my voice is going a bit croaky. Um, it's based on something that's known as directed acyclic graph, or mercifully shortened to DAG. But actually, given what it looks like, most people refer to the IOTA, tang the IOTA structure as the tangle. Um, the good thing about it is it's a completely free, open source, permissionless protocol. It's available to everybody. You can download it from GitHub, make use of it, adapt it, even contribute to its development. Um, it is, though, very much supported and developed by a very well-funded not-for-profit foundation, um, the IOTA Foundation, registered in Germany, 
uh, but actually involving members uh, from all over the world. Um, and they are very much developing the product and moving it forward. Also alongside that, though, is a very strong community and a very growing ecosystem, <laughs> which I'll talk about in uh, a little while. Um, so what is it? It aims to be a ubiquitous technical standard for the machine-to-machine -machine economy. That's all well and good, but what's it capable of doing? Um, firstly, it supports um, fee-less transactions. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lifesaver. We can't have it expiring on, on the live stream. <laughs> oh, that's much better. Right, thank you. Um, so firstly, it supports fee-less transactions, the ability to send very small amounts of value between one wallet and another. Um, particularly if you were trading data, then you might want to trade that data very s for very small values. Um, there are no miners in the way IOTA works, so there are no mining fees. So no loss of funds if you, as you transfer money from one wallet to another. Um, IOTA also supports data propagation. At its core, um, it's what's known as a gossip protocol. So data that you send to one node, one server, is then transferred to other servers, and at a very rapid rate, that data is distributed all over the world. Um, there's also a feature, though, built within IOTA, known as masked authenticated messaging, and that provides a mechanism for securing that data cryptographically, and then it's only readable by those you've provided a private key. The third thing is it's infinitely scalable by design. So with blockchain, um, blockchain gets slower the more transactions that are actually pushed at the network, whereas in theory, and it's to be fully proven, but IOTA will actually perform faster and faster the more transactions that are actually pushed at the network. And finally, and it's kind of a little bit of a sort of technical feature, uh, but it's very relevant in terms of the Internet of Things where you've got devices that may not be permanently attached to the Internet and may for periods of time work in isolation. Uh, they can still continue to use the protocol, continue to um, place transactions that will form what's known as a side tangle, and then later when their connection back to the Internet is re-established, then you can... Um, reconnect back to the main net and so complete those transactions. So, um, very much feeless, permissionless, scalable, secure and quite flexible distributed ledger technology. If you want to develop in IOTA, you can establish your own nodes and become part of the network. Um, it's very easy to do that. As I've said, everything's downloadable from GitHub. Um, there's even a playbook on there that will do most of the installation process for you. Um, but you don't need a node in order to be able to make use of the protocol. If you were building your own applications, making use of this, you just want to build those client applications. Again, available from GitHub, there's plenty of um, client libraries and tools that you can download and make use of to make use of the APIs. Um, I said I'd talk a little bit about the ecosystem. This is the um, URL to the web portal that supports that ecosystem. On there, you can find a um, whole um, set of information on developers, on projects, a whole variety of tutorial information. Um, projects that are on there, um, people can um, make donations to those projects. I've got one project on there that's had a thousand pounds donated to it, which was very nice. Um, but there is also within the ecosystem something that's known as um, the Ecosystem Fund, and there's about £10 million set aside for grants for anybody who wants to work with IO to incorporate it within to their projects, and those grants will be given out by the Foundation. Finally, I, I just want to touch on Cubic, um, a whole area of technology uh, that's still in development, but if anybody knows the Ethereum platform and the concept of smart contracts, that's all so being developed for IOTA at the moment. Um, along with smart contracts, though, it has functionality for oracles, which is a way of getting external data into the network, and also for distributed computing. So um, it's certainly an evolving product, and there's a lot of exciting new technology coming along with it.
Um, just to give you an indication of how seriously, though, this technology is being uh, taken, um, I just want to talk a little bit about the key IOTA partners. So these are companies like Bosch, VW, Fujitsu. If you don't know DNB, that's uh, one of the largest banks in Norway. Um, Sinopac is a financial services conglomerate based out of uh, Taiwan. Um, each of these are very much involved and in a signed partnership with IOTA. Uh, Volkswagen have announced that they're going to be using IOTA to do um, over-the-air software updates um, and using the IOTA to record that data and to maintain the audit trail of the updates they've provided. Um, I'll just do one of the others. Sinopac Holdings are doing something with uh, what's known as I certific certificates, uh, which is notarization of documents and again, holding that data within the network. So, very quick whistle stop tour through IOTA. Um, hope that was of interest. Happy to take any questions um, and uh, my contact details are there if anybody wants to follow up with me afterwards. I'm sorry my voice is so crappy <laughs> this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So, so this is the uh, this is our two getting serious, I think, really, and then and sorting out its uh, um, the infrastructure behind it. So, uh, any questions for Adrian? No questions. Oh, we got one question here. Is there any other questions? Right, you got one question, Adrian, which is good. Hi, I'm uh, Jujar Panesar from Cent DS. Do you see IOTA completely replacing blockchain at some point in the um, future, or do you see it working in co-harmony with blockchain? Um, certainly the latter. I don't think blockchain will disappear. I think there are some genuine uses for our, um, blockchain. Sorry, my voice really is going today, isn't it? Um, and particularly in terms of larger transaction values, then I think there's a reason why blockchain might be used. Uh, but around Internet of Things devices, I think there's far more functionality that's relevant for, uh, with regard to IOTA. Very good. Last round of applause. Okay, we need the uh, Pinnacle Solutions people who are talking. So on the... we go Alastair and Mark, who are supposed to be talking. So we're... Oh, and someone's here. Very good. So who's talking? Mark's talking. Perfect timing. Introduce yourself. We'll get your slides up. Thank you. Morning, everybody. My name's Mark Lowe. I'm Business Development Director for Pinnacle. Um, pretty much here, I think, to talk about 10 minutes of your time around IoT and what journey we've been on. Um, I am not technical before we even start, so please forgive me that. But if you want technical, there's a man sat over there who will take every single one of those queries from you. Um, right, okay, let me let me dive in. Are we uh, on this one? Okay, great. Um, quick overview, who are Pinnacle? Um, I think it's fair to say we're beginning to get a reasonable reputation around the IoT space at the moment. Um, but as always, there's so many out there, it's always handy to at least give people an overview of who we are and what we're about. So, won't go through them all. We've been around for quite a long time, um, still obviously in the SME ca category, um, which actually has helped us, I think, be a, bit, a little bit agile and a bit, a bit innovative um, as a smaller organisation. Um, heritage, yet yeah, wireless and networking for 30 years or more. So IoT really became a natural evolution for us in terms of technology and paths and trends. Um, we deployed a smart city solution in Newport, which I will have a little slide on in a moment, um, which was pretty much our IoT prototype on a city scale. I think at the time there were a few cities claiming to be smart cities, um, but actually when you scratch beneath the surface of a few of those, um, it was maybe one gateway on a tower block or something like that. Um, we lit the entire city of Newport up. Um, so I will talk about that one. Since then, we're now, we've done it in York, um, which is obviously not too far from here. Um, and we're also currently looking at Aberdeen. Um, there are another three cities that we're talking to at the moment. Not just all about smart cities. Obviously, IoT goes across the whole domain. It's smart places, smart solutions. And I think as our title slide said, sometimes there's some smart choices out there as well. Um, 
But yeah, with IoT, I think what we found, as much as um, we, we've, we're kind of in the heart of the technology trend, as it were, we like to feel we are, um, it's all about partners as well. It's all about, I think, ecosystems. And I know in the previous presentation, ecosystems, I think it, it's a fair comment. Um, it's so rapid, it's so fast, it's so innovative. Um, I'm simply not clever enough to keep pace with it, to be honest with you. So there are other people out there who can do that. So for us, it's very much around creating that ecosystem. Um, I actually don't mind to say that probably before we started this, you know, I've probably had a lot more hair than I do today. Um, it's not been the easiest journey, and I don't mind admitting that. It's been hard, it's been brutal. Um, Alice is only 21. Um, but it, it is a lot of this, there's, there's people out there who are claiming to have the, the, the sensor to, to cure all your problems. And we've done it, we've bought sensors from all over the world, and a few of them are rubbish. But until you actually put them in a real life environment and do some real life testing and analysis and reporting, that's when the unfortunate is the only time they really come to, to, to fruit and to bear. But we'd like to think we've taken a lot of that pain. We are where we are. So we've now got a series of manufacturers for sensors that we work with around the network enablement platforms and as well as working with some reputable people around the actual um, applications to display all this lovely sensor technology, um, we've also developed our own. So Newport, how did this come, come about? We'd worked with Newport for quite a while, about three or four years, and we were talking to the council about smart solutions or smart city ambitions, digital ambitions. Um, so we decided that we would actually build this network for Newport. So we built a IoT network based on LoRaWAN. Um, you know, there's obviously a number of them out there, but that was the one that we went with. And there's a whole different conversation I'm happy to have about why we chose LoRaWAN. Um, just for completeness, we are a Sigfox partner as well, but LoRaWAN was the, the solution of choice for us down in Newport. And at the time, we pretty much lit the whole city up with four gateways, that's all. Um, obviously, that's the benefit of LP1, low power WAM. You don't need as many of these gateways like you would with a Wi-Fi network. But the sacrifice you make there is obviously one of speed. This is IoT, is, it's machine to machine. It's not you and I doing YouTube and, and, and doing social media on it. It's not for that. It's very, very slow, but it's very, very reaching and far in terms of its coverage. Um, we built the network, all we asked the council to do was really commit to at least try and put some use cases on there. And one of the ones that was really prevalent and it still is for Newport is air quality. And I think air quality as well is quite um, popular and it's, and, it, and it's certainly in, in the media a lot and with government at the moment. But Newport have a real problem with air quality. Um, they actually take measurements for air quality across 80 locations in the city. Um, what we are looking at is a way of taking it away from the current manual process, which is little sort of glass vials, glass cylinders, so sort of attached to lampposts and things around the city. And they're collected manually and stamped and recorded and logged and sent off for reporting to replace that with a real-time air quality solution that is taking readings. <coughs> well, don't worry about it, it's fine. I like a distraction, it's okay. Takes it off me. Um, is... Um, really around looking at one that at the moment we're not sure that it's going to be every half an hour or so that this thing will take readings, these sensors will take readings every half an hour. So to understand a problem, you know, to, sorry, to cure a problem or address a problem, you need to understand the problem. You know, one snapshot in time once a month is not helping the environmental and scientific teams understand how the, air pack, the impact of air quality is. Um, we're looking at waste management, um, flood monitoring again. Um, road temperatures was actually quite one. We did um, talking about that ecosystem. Um, the road temperature sensors were actually bought from Birmingham University. So universities are coming to us with ideas and solutions, which is great. We were 100% behind that, sort of supporting that initiative. Great success, road temperatures, it's a straightforward solution. It's an infrared thermometer that's really taking the temperature of the road meant to be for um, winter, gritting. It's another reference point. Do we send the gritters out? Do we not? Um, interestingly, this year, we were actually being more, I, I'm going to use the word amused, by the readings with the summer that we've had and the temperatures that some of these roads reached in Newport. Newport's not known for great weather, I'm honest with you, but when you've got a road surface reaching 48 degrees 
it was quite to the point where you think, actually, what do we do with this? I mean, are we at, a point, at what point does tarmac get sticky? What ta at what point does it melt? Um, thankfully, it didn't melt, but it was a whole new problem that we never actually encountered. Um, we're talking to the, to the city now and the council about things like smart lighting, smart buildings, um, you know, smart meters, and also um, down in Newport, there is a port, and it's run by ABP. Um, we're talking to ABP early stages around a port solution. So, how does this look and become real? This is our dashboard from the, the application, sorry, that, um, that we've developed. Um, a, a very landing page level, icons, different icons are showing different sensors out in the, that have been deployed. Down the left are the various so solutions that we're looking at, um, air quality, you know, what you might see on there, obviously I didn't go into too much detail, was one about housing. Social housing is actually a very, very big um, sort of uh, market for us at the moment, and there's an awful lot of interest coming from there, and I'll cover that in a little moment. Um, and from that, you can click on, obviously, the sensor. Color coding is for a reason. Green, good. Red, bad. Or red, there's an alert of some sort. Amber would be something's going on. Um, right, let me go on to the next one. Obviously... In terms of what I was just saying there, for us, the idea that this came about is that when we're talking particularly to Newport City Council, they wanted one place. There were all these IoT solutions that they're looking at. They're looking to go to one place for them all. And that's really how this has come about and developed. And that list on the left will just grow as we do more and more solutions with them. And it's just one place that they can go and access. Social housing. Um, we, we're working with, I think, there are seven housing associations at the moment with active pilots around using sensor technology. Predominantly, this has come around um, from um, maintenance and, and, and understanding what's going on in the property. So biggest challenges that when we've talked to social housing is, is damp and mould is number one. That's the one that comes out. Quite often, it's too late when they get the call. When they go in and do the surveying or the, 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 the visit, they're already facing some either expensive decorative works or worst case, they've got to dehouse the tenant, gut the place and redo it and then put the tenant back in. So one of the words that people like Halton Housing, who we work with, use is things like preemptive maintenance. So the idea is the sensors go in. Um, I'll jump. Is it there? Yeah, OK. Um, this is a snapshot of a, of a house that we've got in, with sensors for up, up to four sensors depending on the property. Um, lounge, bedroom, kitchen, bathroom. Um, normally what we would recommend is that the kitchen and the bathroom are just temperature and humidity. That's all they're looking at. And then the lounge, we would add CO2. I'll come on to why we would do that. And there's an option to put CO2 in the bedroom, if you would, or you can stick to just damp, um, temperature and humidity. And clearly what we're looking at here is on the left there with the color bars is the key measurements that we've been told to look at from these housing associations as I said um, damp and mold is always number one so in this scenario th uh, four amber boxes across the top is that every single one of those rooms is is currently t doing some sorts of readings that would say within the next 30 days you will have either damp or mold forming in that property in those rooms if it's not addressed if it actually got to within sort of 14 or 15 days, it would drop to a red critical alert. Good thing about this tool, obviously it's great that it's a dashboard that you can go in and look at and log in, but it's proactive. It will do the alerting for you as well. So Newport City Homes, 9,500 properties, and there are eight surveyors. So that's where we do the math that they simply cannot do quality checks as much as they would like to. So something that's giving them advanced and proactive information about properties allows either the contact centre or the surveyors to decide whether they need to go and visit a property sooner, later, or put a call in. Um, other one is voids, uh, empty, empty property. So again, it's, that's actually a bit of a problem for housing associations, um, particularly if you don't know it's empty. So again, using things like the CO2, we can, we can baseline measurements of what we as humans produce CO2. So if a property starts to flatline on a CO2 reading over and above two weeks, two week holiday, we all, got, we all have holidays, so you don't want to overreact too soon. 
then it might start triggering an alert to say you might want to check this out. Um, likewise, opposite of that, unauthorised occupancy. You think it's vacant and there are significant CO2 readings. It's not vacant. Something, someone is in that property. Um, and then the last one is fuel poverty. Um, I, I think it's fair to say this one came about by accident because obviously we were in there talking to housing associations about a proactive maintenance solution to help them manage their stock better. But when you're measuring temperature and humidity, but the temperature particularly, in the depths of winter, if we start to see a property that is being, it's habitable, it's being lived in, and we're seeing temperatures sub 15, 14, 13 degrees around the house in winter, and one room is showing us nice and cozy and warm, then we've kind of got one of those situations where stereotypical as it is, we might have an elderly person sat in that lounge with the one room in the house warm and the rest of the house freezing. And then when they move from that room and go to bed, or what, we're talking all sorts of cases that can come about. Um, when we first identified that this was possible and how this would come about, most of the housing associations were kind of like, that's not really our responsibility but we like the fact that this can do it because actually maybe we might turn around and decide to be um, responsible landlords and at least we could even make a phone call to the next of kin or even if we're passing, knock on that door, go and see this person, have a conversation and it may well preempt and prevent a genuine fuel poverty case. On that note, from fuel poverty, obviously led us on a, in our vision thinking, okay, we are now, we've gone away from property health to tenant health, and that's not where we started out on, the, on this journey. Um, however, I'm glad to report that that is actually where we're taking our ev evolving IoT portfolio now. Um, we've partnered up with a new startup backed by IBM, a company called Carantis, um, who actually are doing an IoT solution that came from the healthcare and it is, has found itself into housing. Um, there's a bit of a combination here because I think we're across social housing, between 40 and 50% of social housing tenants might be under some sort of social care. Um, our solution for social care right now is more at the domiciliary care, the, the sort of elderly care at home solutions. But again, sensor-based technology, doing something completely different to this one, but around the person. And then again, proactively alerting, linked with care agencies, even linked with the family, which is critical in some of these cases. So that's where we're going. That's the quickest whistle stop tour I can give you of what we've been doing over the last few couple of years. Um, and I'm happy to take questions, or Alice there is. Thank you. Round of applause. Thank you. So, questions. Anyone got any questions? We've got one there. Any others? We've got one over there. Um, got one there. Okay, we'll take, there's three questions, and I've got one as well. Okay. Um, fantastic, uh, fascinating talk. Um, really interested about the networks. We've got a Laurent Gateway in the window over there, if you have a look, and we've been helping Bradford and, and Leeds uh, with that. Yeah. Um, the other part is housing, yeah. uh, public social good, government money. Uh, how do you think uh, requirements around open source, open standards, um, sharing um, should be implemented in the world because obviously a great a gr great solution for one place and one location but how do we scale that how do we learn how do we collectively make a massive difference to all those people in either using social housing or elsewhere so it's a big question but quick one okay quick one um, how, how do we do it bigger and better obviously there's you know open standards open standards so that's why yeah. we went with LoRaWAN because that is in the IoT world, that's the pretty much yeah. the open standard yeah. technology solution, so that's why we went that way. Yeah. Um, combining data sets, I think four of our um, active pilots now are all doing data share, want to do data share. So that's York, who are looking with Newport and with Halton and possibly places for people. Um, open publishing? Uh, they are, yes, yeah. Um, one of the journeys we went on around m more engagement around this is um, down in Newport. There's, um, we engaged one of the universities who were doing some courses, and we got the students to look at how maybe this sensor technology and information that's, that's being harboured in the um, social housing's um, maintenance division, let's say, predominantly, how can you actually 
encourage the tenants to want these sensors as well as actually interact with them. So we had this, Alice and I did a few presentations, some of these students, and they went off doing some materials and th thoughts, and it was everything from, you know, like a model in the house um, that would change colour depending on what was going on with the sensors. Um, all, all we haven't, we, you know, as it was, the, their, their brief was to write some material on it, not to actually develop it and create it for us, but there were some great solutions that they came out with, um, and we're still talking with sort of University of South Wales around some of those. Um, technology, obviously, um, as I said, Laura One is just one of IoT technologies. Yeah. You know, our air quality sensors use um, Wi-Fi, so we can use Wi-Fi. Um, we can use Laura One. Um, if a sensor was available on Sigfox, we would take Sigfox. If it, you know, our gateways, when you want, uh, you know, unfortunately, a, a, an ideal placement for a, a Laura One gateway is quite a remote vantage point. Um, so getting some sort of connectivity up there, for, for example, can be rather difficult. Um, but because the bandwidths typically are quite low from all of these <coughs> sensors, even if you've got, you know, dare I say, thousands of them, um, you can use your backhaul on 3G and 4G, yeah. which is what we're doing. So we're kind of using all the different technologies we can to, and then obviously, like you say, you've got your gateway over there. There's internal gateways, external gateways, so we blend those as well. But we'll always, the... Um, healthcare solution uses, ideally, when it's domiciliary care, we're looking to use um, a, a patient's broadband, for example, for that, for the backhaul. But again, if there's no broadband, we can look at 3G, 4G, etc. Fantastic. Okay? So. Question there. Sorry. Um, Give me a Verdi housing leads. So, you know, a large social provider, and as you've said, the growth is has to be in welfare of uh, tenants, as an example. Yeah. So, in the housing association world, you started off with assets, but you're moving on to welfare. So how have the tenants reacted to you know, the intervention and uh, where does it stop, basically? There's been different responses from different people. Um, Newport City Homes didn't ha seem to have an issue. They, must, you know, they, went, they selected the pilot pool of people and they didn't just want to go to the good. They wanted to maybe think, throw in a couple of the more susceptible ones. Um, York did a great thing, actually. Um, they actually created a, a sort of PDF and an FAQ to preempt questions, concerns around why this technology was going to come in the house. So that one, I would say, is that I think the more you engage them and you're open with them, you know, most people seem to be okay with it. You know, the ones that aren't, with all due respect, there's a, a tiny minority that might not be okay with it because they don't want you to know what's going on in the property, and that can be everything from the, you know, headline grabbing illegal activity that can take place in social housing. Um, but also, you know, even more, um, you know, that the are still illegal but different is where people are obviously doing illegal subletting and things like that. So again, you've got things where you think you've got a, you know, three bedroomed house and then you never know, the surveyors go in and it, it's suddenly a six bedroom house. I mean, it's again, it's stuff you see on the TV but actually talking to some of the housing associations and I don't know about your own personal experiences, but that can be a problem as well. Um, so, you know, I think for us, it, it's an, it is an interesting one to go with that from the welfare, but starting with the property one and the tenants, I think engagement's key, communication is key, and for our experience, there's not been a lot of resistance so far. Social care is an interesting one. And I, where, know, where was the next question? Wait, wait for the microphone. Then we're on the, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Bromham from Save Nine. Hi. Uh, I'm interested to see that you were involved in uh, networking early on in the business. Yeah. Uh, is that still one of the main services, core services that uh, Pinnacle provides? Uh, yeah, don't get me wrong. Yeah, we're still very big around sort of networking solutions and Wi Fi solutions. Um, particularly, we're doing, we do quite a lot around public Wi Fi, especially. Um, but yeah, uh, that is our heritage, networking. And, and networking for me is LAM1, internet security. It's, it's all of those things. Yeah, because it leads on to the, the second part of the question is that, uh, did you see like the IoT uh, services as like a natural evolution of the business to layer it on top of your, your, your wireless and, uh, and internet services? Yeah, our, our interpretation, I say our, myself and Alistair, our little vision about a smart city was layers of a city. So, you know, everything under networking as well, we do things like dark fiber networks as well. So, you know, there's a lot going on around that as probably some of you in public sector will be well aware around LFFN. But, um, so in Newport, for example, we, we've got a dark fiber network, we've got a public Wi-Fi network, 
So for our little vision of what we thought were basics of a smart city, those layers, the third layer that was missing was an IoT network. And that's why we chose Newport to do that. We had dark fiber, we had Wi-Fi. We wanted to prove the model by putting an IoT network in. So yeah, that's how we came about. Thank you. We've got one more question and then we'll move on to Jem. So what's over there, Nick? I am sticking around, by the way, if there's yeah, any more. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Hi, um, Lisa Gibson from Leeds Health Partnerships team. Um, so we're sort of in our team, we're aware of the work you can do around supporting people who have already got conditions, and, and you talked about that domi dom domiciliary Domic care yeah, work. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, but we're also trying to sort of, if you think about making a massive saving and really shifting population health, it is looking at that um, proactive um, prevention work. And you sort of really briefly touched on that work you were doing with Parenthes. And I just Correct, wondered yeah. if you'd be willing to say a bit more about it. That would interest. Uh, but yeah, I, I, can, I can do it pretty quickly. I'll, by all means, I'll, I'll have a conversation with you, won't I? Um, so where that, so that solution is based on sensors. And at the moment, there's, there's a core set of sensors. And it's things like um, a motion sensor, humidity sensor, which goes near the kettle. Um, it is um, a bed sensor and a, um, a, a movement sensor that you might put down the back of a favorite chair. So in domiciliary care, and I will openly, my dad would kill me for saying this, but I put my dad firmly in this domiciliary care category. If I turned up to my dad tonight and said, I'm gonna put a load of sensors in your house, I would probably be out the front door quicker than anything. But if I say to my dad, it's either sensors or a, or a care home, he will he'll want Blackpool illuminations in his house to keep him at home. And I think that's the big thing. So it's an intrusive solution for the right reasons, because it's all about trending that, that habitual, patient in domiciliary care uh, my dad I can tell you exactly how his day goes every day and that's you know and, and sensors learn that and the, the technology behind it this IBM Watson platform is learning about it and then obviously the minute you deviate from that or something's out of kilter would trigger the alert so it allows you to even if you've got seven patients to go and see today in a care organization's agenda if someone's got an alert you can push them to the top and you would go you know, so that might be someone who you know, normally gets up at 8.30, between 8.30 and 8, 8.30 in the morning, and at 10 o'clock they're still in the bed. Not necessarily critical, but it, it's something you might want to know about. And it could be everything from them being infirm and they need sort of a mobility aid and they've knocked it over and they're stranded in bed. Well, you can just uh, reorganize your day and you've intervened on something quite minor that could become a bit more serious. So that's kind of where that one's going from. Is that okay? Sorry. So, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think everyone's going to be around for uh, tea and, and um, for catch up. Jem's up next, and Glenn, where's Glenn? Glenn's here. So, you're just before tea and coffee. So, we'll do two more talks, then we'll have a cup of tea, we'll have a chat, and then we'll have the next session. So, Jem, friend of ODI Leeds. Right, hello, hello, hello. Hello, right, I'm Jem Henderson. Um, I am here from IoT UK, um, which I will be talking about today. So, um, does it, who knows about the IoT UK program here? That's good, that's good. So, I, I'm just here to fill you in, because it's been, it's been a complicated project uh, over the course of three and a half years. I've worked for IoT UK for two years. And um, it's just, it's been a fantastic project to work for. Uh, unfortunately, it is coming to an end at the end of next week, so whew, no pressure for getting the blog posts out about this. Um, but anyway, so um, yeah, I'm here to tell you all about the work that we've done. Um, uh, yeah, so me, hello. I am the community manager at Digital Catapult. Um, I, I have kind of really been bedded down in the ecosystem, which has included public sector, private businesses, and academia. Um, I'm the project lead for the IoT Nation database, which I'll tell you a bit more about at later. Uh, I'm a writer by trade. The reason that I'm not too nervous is because I get up and talk about poetry quite a lot, so I can get up in front of a crowd, which isn't too bad. I'm a massive geek. I can probably talk about Star Trek four hours more than any of you. That's a challenge. Um, and one of the things I'm really genuinely passionate about is how technology can benefit people. So when I came on board to the IoT UK program, it was essentially a dream come true because it's essentially like putting together Star Trek and how to help people today. So it's been fantastic. Right, so, th as I said, the um, IoT UK programme has been made up by, uh, of, of many complicated parts. 
And one of the main parts that I've worked on is Petrus. Now, Petrus is the academic part of, um, of the IoT UK programme. It stands for Privacy, Ethics, Trust, Reliability, Acceptability and Security. And it's all about how IoT has been uh, rolling out in the world, whether from, we're talking about transport and mobility with connected automatic vehicles, through to drones monitoring parking and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Now, I've, I've done some absolutely fantastic projects with Petrus, ranging from, uh, there was the Bit Barista project. Now, Bit Barista was a coffee machine which you pay for your coffee with Bitcoin. Actually, when they started that project, they didn't quite expect that the coffee machine was going to be a millionaire by the end of the project, <laughs> but that <laughs> regardless happened. Um, so that's a fun, so one of the things that they have been exploring is how things on the Internet of Things actually become their own entities. So if you pay for a coffee with your Bitcoin, that coffee machine has a wallet. Then that coffee machine, when it runs out of coffee beans, can go, excuse me, to the next person, could you potentially uh, fill my coffee pod up? And then it'll pay the person that fills them up in, in Bitcoin, which then means, in theory, is that coffee machine a person, almost, on the Internet of Things? Because these are some of the dynamics that we have to start thinking about when we're talking about the Internet of Things. Um, it's the same with cars. If we've got electric vehicles that can be charged up on the road as they're driving along, then they can go to a garage, pay for the mechanic to do the work to them, um, so this, this is, a, this is a something called object-orientated ontology. So yeah, where the things on the Internet of Things are themselves. We've got another project which is looking at something similar called Polly the Kettle, which is a smart kettle, which can tell you that your friends are coming around because it can see that they're coming, so you don't even have to ring them anymore. Brilliant. Um, another project with Petrus was they were uh, looking at smart contracts. Now, in the future, well, you know, I, I don't know how many people here are married, um, I'm married. Um, in the future, we might not think of marriage as something that lasts forever, but you might be able to get married to somebody in a bar because for financial reasons, do it on the blockchain, and then two weeks later go, yeah, actually, nah, done that, and then get rid of it on the blockchain. So some of the professors at the University of Edinburgh have been marrying people on the blockchain as part of Edinburgh Fringe. I don't know how I feel about that personally. Um, Another exciting part of Petrus has been, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the connected automatic vehicles work. Now, I interview, inter, uh, interviewed Professor Carson Maple this week, and he was talking about um, how Britain is really, really well placed to be a world leader. It already is a world leader in connected automatic vehicles. But because of our ecosystem, because we're quite small and because everybody talks to everybody, um, it's actually making it much easier to roll out connected automatic vehicles. For example, at Millbrook, they have just um, implemented a big 5G network. So that's being used for these uh, automatic cars. And one of the things that they want to do now is simulations. Now, they could do simulations there and put all of the technology in there and spend all of that money. But actually, because everybody talks to everybody in the UK, what they've done is they've said, well, no, they've already got that at the University of Warwick. So we don't need to worry about that. So they're doing the simulations at Warwick. The work's continuing. And it means that we're, hopefully, way ahead of everybody else when it comes to rolling out smart cars, which is very exciting. Um, I could talk about Petrus for hours. I mean, from everything from insurance, which sounds really boring. But actually, when you think about it, if you get out of your house, get into a car which drives you to work, who's responsible for that if the car crashes? Is it you? Is it the car? Is it? Who knows? So all sorts of work has been going on to explore that. Um, as I said earlier, another part of, um, a big part of what I've been doing uh, has been the IoT UK Nation database. Now that was a project we did with Paul um, uh, from ODI Leeds and uh, also j -Wing Intelligence. Now it's been a fascinating project which has explored um, all of the businesses that are making up the IoT nation, as we call it. So when we first measured how many businesses were involved with IoT three years ago, it was less than 600. Now, we've, we ran this, when did we finish? <laughs> yeah, so we ran this recently and it, w it turns out that there are more than twice as many companies working in IoT, and that's 31 just here in Leeds, which is really exciting. 81% um, of academic institutions are researching IoT, and that's 110 universities. Now, actually, I got a, um, an email yesterday from a chap who 
is at a school and he was asking about posters for IoT for kids because IoT has gone from being three years ago kind of this inchoate technology which nobody really knows about through to I've got school teachers going oh how can we teach kids about it because it has really become part of our society and really bedded down in how everybody lives and another exciting uh, stat is with uh, Petrus the work that they've done they had uh, 1,100 businesses connected to them. So all of these businesses are learning about IoT, cutting edge technology, and how we can roll it out to better improve society. Um, sorry, I should have got some water. Uh, CityVerve was uh, part, of, part of the work that we did, which was the smart city demonstrator in Manchester. Now that was called the platform of platforms. So as, as you were saying earlier, often when you find smart cities, they're rolling out some sensor technology and they call themselves smart cities. But actually, that's not really that smart. And one of the things that Manchester CityVerve project did was it looked at ways that we could integrate all of these different sensors and all of these different all of this different data and put it together so that we can see that if some if pollution monitoring is happening at this bus stop and we know that this person is being monitored for their asthma we can then send a text message to that person to say don't get the bus from there today it's too there's too much pollution why don't you try getting it from there instead so how it's been a really fantastic project to really bring together open data which I'm sure Paul will get excited about, <laughs> um, and how we can apply real smart technology to a city. Now, there, there are applications all over. So health and social care was one of the strands that they were looking at. Now, one of the things that they have done, which has been really fantastic, is, you know, care in the community where people are out and about and somebody might need a bandage. What has been, what happened up till recently is they would have to go find out somebody needed a bandage, go back to a centre point and then go take them the bandage again, which is a complete waste of time. And as we know, there are more and more people needing more care in the community. So instead of doing that, using IoT and using smart city technology, they can see where all of the things are. They can see if there's a commode here or bandages here and actually have it distributed into the community, which is then meaning that m more people can be seen, more people can be treated, and it's really benefiting the citizens of Manchester. Um, obviously, Manche Manchester's got some fantastic transport. and I mean, I don't really want to talk about Manchester because I'm in Yorkshire and I'm from Yorkshire and it feels weird. Um, but my favourite part of City Verve was the... Um, culture and public realm. Now we can all sit in here and we can talk about smart cities, I'm sure we all know what they are, but actually you bog standard person walking down the street, if you say smart city to them, they just go, eh? So one of the things that um, City Verve did, which I think differs from a lot of the smart city projects that have, uh, have gone uh, before, is they really talked to the people that lived in, in Manchester and worked out how, how they could engage with them and how they could get them to understand what a smart city is. So one project which I really enjoyed was called Everything Everywhere, which was an art installation which used, you know the front of buses used to have that ticker stuff with all the dots and it would tell you in words where the bus was going. Well they used an old one of those and they captured data from all of the APIs across the city and they turned it into words. So it basically presented it as a found poetry and they had this installed in a community garden and in the library. And this project said, the cellist is playing. The nurse gets on the bus. And all of these different pieces of information were being captured by the sensors. And then people could understand, oh, this is what it means. And actually helps them to explain, yeah, it is private. You know, if you say the nurse gets on the bus, what nurse? What bus? It, it doesn't have to be scary. And I think cyber sec and security is a big worry for people when they talk about smart cities. So projects like that have been fantastic to um, alleviate people's tension about the whole thing. Another really cool project um, was uh, PlaceCal. Now, I don't know if this is technically an IoT project, but it is a smart city project, and I think it's fantastic. They, um, how many of you know what happens in your local community hall? Probably not many of you, because where do you find that information? It can be really, really challenging. Um, now, one of, one of the people involved with CityVerb is very, very, very passionate about social inequality. And I was talking to them on the phone, and they said, there seems to be a drive to get people's radiators and boilers and kettles on the internet before poor people. 
And actually, that's really sad. We can't leave people behind. So what one of the things that they've done is they've built a platform which allows people in communities to engage with the smart city, put all of the information about everything that's happening in one place, and then from that, two people who went to a food bank to get their food found out that just half an hour after that happened, they could actually access a free meal, which was happening in exactly the same place that they got the food from the food bank, and then they could get hot food and, could, and people to talk to them. So anyway, yeah, there's been some absolutely fantastic parts of, of City of Irvine, and I'm really proud to have been part of it. Um, we've also been involved in a couple of hardware accelerators. Uh, so there was RGA Ventures and Startup Bootcamp IoT. Uh, they were three month projects. Um, running out of London isn't everything. Um, um, actually, that's not fair. We've also um, been involved with AOT Tribe, which is the um, hardware accelerator running out of Barnsley, um, which I'm really pleased that you know it's not all happening in London. So there were 10, 10 businesses in each cohort which of the one of my favourite ones in this one uh, was a company who used cameras at football matches to capture a picture of everybody's face when somebody scores, which I think is really cool. You know, when you go on a roller coaster and you get your picture and you're like, hey, and you all look silly. Well, it's the same thing essentially, but applied to to football. So yeah, that that I mean, that's kind of. I like arty weird things when it comes to IoT. It's all well and good talking about digital manufacturing, but it gets a bit tedious sometimes. Um, so we've also rolled out some LP1 trials uh, here um, in uh, Saltaire, in Halifax, in Calderdale. We helped um, with some of their projects with AB Open. Things Connected is the big London LP1 um, project. So we. Uh, they've worked with uh, a lot of local councils like Croydon, uh, Watford, Bournemouth, some people in Wales. Um, so yeah, essentially start, because one of the problems we've seen over the last three years is we can talk about IoT all we want, but if we don't have IoT network everywhere, then what good is it? So I think we've done quite a lot to help regionally and in London to roll out LP1, kind of raise the knowledge and, and help support businesses who were kind of at the cutting edge at the time going, right, how, d how do we get this technology out there? So it's been, we, yeah, we've, some of the um, projects that we've supported with that have gone on to do space monitoring for the NHS, to do elderly monitoring um, with dementia patients in Bupa, uh, with the Environment Agency, with pollution monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another part of the program was the NHS IoT test beds. Now these were two projects down south. One which was um, the Diabetes Digital Coach, which was teaching people with diabetes how best to care for themselves. There was also the dementia test bed, which was probably doing something similar to what you were talking about earlier, where you're monitoring for people for falls, for if they abscond on a night, because unfortunately that's something that's quite common. You know, how how can you make sure that their front if someone's front door opens at two o'clock in the morning? then you know they shouldn't really be out and about and you can send somebody to go and make sure that they're going that, that person's okay. Um, one of the um, so one of the things that my job has involved has been putting all of these pieces together. So when the academics start talking about this thing, I don't know, digital ethics in healthcare, and I go, okay, well, why don't you talk to these people who are over on the NHS test beds and kind of joining everything up. Um, it's been a really fantastic project to be part of. I'm slightly sad that it's ending, but obviously Digital Catapult isn't ending its support for IoT, and we're still doing a lot of work in that, and I think I'm still going to be there, which is very exciting. I thought I was done at the <laughs> end of the week, but they like me, so uh, I'm not. Um, anyway, yeah, I think that was all of it. I don't know if that was 10 minutes. <laughs> So thanks, Jem. Any questions for Jem about the work of IoT UK, Digital Catapult stuff? Okay, brilliant. But you're going to be around. Yeah, it's next to Right. So, last conversation chat before we get a cup of tea. Everyone okay? Energy levels good? All right. Fab. Where are you? Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Glenn Breen from Elastic Cloud. Um, 
I'm going to talk to you today about um, how we help customers get business value out of their data, and a big part of that is uh, IoT these days. Okay, thank you. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, I've, I've, I've titled it Business Value from, from Your Data. I'm, I've thought today what I'd do is I'd look at IoT, obviously, the, the main theme, but actually I also wanted to cover it as a slightly wider subject because IoT, typically for us, is, um, it's, it, in essence, it's where data's coming from. And what we help people do is take their data from many, many different areas, which I'll touch on in a minute, uh, and I'll analyze it, predict on it, et cetera, and, and get more value from it. And I think I need the clicker. Yes. Is it this guy? Oh, okay. So, quick agenda. I'll ask the cloud who we are, what we do. I want to talk a bit about data science because that's uh, a big part of what we do. Then I'll look at IoT, some examples, and, and a call to action. And what I'm just going to touch on there is how we help people start the journey because a lot of the times, companies or, and organisations and people want to want to get moving. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. So, passionate about driving value into our customers through data and, 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 and innovation. A um, bit, bit of an overview, we've been around about eight, nine years now, uh, about 45 people, all data engineers, data scientists. Um, massive uh, you know, work within the cloud space due to all the reasons of cost effective, scalable, secure, all the, all the things you'd expect. But really, it enables people to do a lot more than they ever could before, far more cost effectively. Um, Officers, London, head office, uh, but we've got a, 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 a big office in Nottingham where I'm based, and we've got an office in uh, Spain as well, in Almeria, um, to give us some nearshoring. Um, so BI meets AI. So um, again, on the left-hand side, what I'm going to show here, people, just sort of remind people again, was that data's growing at most stats of 50% uh, every year or two. Uh, a lot of that is IoT, which we'll touch on. Structured and unstructured, so structured tends to be the stuff that we're more familiar with, uh, with databases, SQL, you know, those types of things. Um, unstructured, where there's been massive growth, is, you know, all your things like your pictures, etc. cetera. Um, what we do with organizations is, is take that, whether that's from an IoT sensor or whether it's from some of the other uh, areas that data's coming from, let them um, get it into a shape where we can understand it, make sure it's in the right format, clean it, et cetera. Um, and then uh, enable us to look at that from the point of view of getting value out of that with, a, with an ROI, typically, if it's a, if it's a commercial situation, obviously. Uh, that's what people are bothered about, is how is it going to impact what's going to be better because we're doing it than it, than it was before. Um, we've got a team of data scientists that then write algorithms, et cetera, on that. I, I tend to view this piece um, as capturing data that's historic is, is, is great, really important, always been important, will continue to be important. Analysis on that's great. Um, and then you can look at that and then draw conclusions from it, plan around it, et cetera. That's the BI piece. Then the bit I sort of also then, the way I sort of explain it to a lot of people is that you've got the ability with data science and some of the more, uh, more, more, uh, more modern techniques like uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, to in effect look, look forward. So what you're really doing is predicting what's going to happen. Got loads of examples of that, but I just wanted to sort of set the scene. I mentioned we do a lot of it in, in the cloud, a bit of a technical slide here, just to pick, pitch that out. But from, from a lot of, I find a lot of customers, uh, particularly when you're talking more to the IT side, they kind of want to see where it sits within, within that world. So, you know, data on the left, so, you know, uh, sensors and devices, bottom left, w works its way through, and then you, then you get uh, an outcome on the right hand side that's of, that's of value. Um, <coughs> visualization and dashboards is very important. Um, what I really mean is how do you get people to interact with it in a good way so that they're going to make a difference, they're going to ad adopt that change, be able to make the change. So yes, that can be a visualization tool like a Power BI. It can be a, 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 a you know artificial intelligence around Katana, the, you know voice recognition. Um, it can be. Uh, business scenarios with regard to predicting what's going to happen in a more traditional way, like a spreadsheet. So, um, 
got a couple of questions actually when I came in today about how, how do we make sure that projects um, start, are defined, and the outcomes defined and, and what success looks like. So we use the Agile methodology. Uh, as its name implies, Agile meaning um, you decide what you're going to do in a shorter period of time to a, to a, to, to for an overall goal, but actually you, look on the left-hand side, you go, right, let's take input from 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 the stakeholders, the executives, customers, whoever that needs to be that's going to define what success is. Uh, pull together the team. You have a you have a, um, a a very much a project manager methodology where there's a scrum master who controls it all. Typically, these things last for two week periods. So, in other words, at the end of every two weeks, you've got a defined outcome based on what you agreed at the beginning and you have a daily call to say, are oh, things on track, et cetera. It's, it's all to stop those, those horrible sort of things you hear in the press occasionally of projects start and people spend loads of money and at the end of it, they're like, well, what was the benefit of that? And, and, and that's not what we want people to do. So data science, uh, obviously I've only got 10 minutes. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I, I summarize it as making sense of the world using data as, as for some of the previous conversations we've seen this morning. Um, it's that solving the business problem by, or the problem, um, by extracting knowledge from that data. And, and today, obviously, that can be IoT, that can be uh, more traditional uh, data, data sources. So some of the key areas that we're, we're seeing data science is, is playing out in. Um, health detection of cancers, for example. Um, fraud detection, we did one for one of the large, largest uh, retailers around identifying fraud, predicting fraud uh, with RFI sensors. Um, recommender systems, so we, we do that for the likes of ASOS. Um, so it's, ma it's all about making sure that what you're recommending to your customer is absolutely <coughs> relevant to them. Um, and then, as I mentioned there, IoT and uh, Internet of Things, which I'll look at a case, uh, case study in a moment in the uh, civil aviation space. <coughs> Machine learning, so that, 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 that's what we typically do on that data um, as appropriate, so we have um, unsupervised and supervised and supervised learning. In, in essence, what we're doing is taking taking data, building an algorithm that's in effect like having you know hundreds of thousands of people uh, able to look at that really quickly, make decisions, understand, uh, and come up with whether it be come up with <coughs> um, connections, uh, visualization, classifications, but really be able to recommend and show trends or show cohorts or show this is what we think is going to happen. Um, so on, on IoT, appreciate you're probably all aware of most of this, but many different verticals where we're seeing a rapid rise in people wanting to, 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 to look at IoT and use IoT. Um, manufacturing, we'll, 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 I'm going to give a, an example of that in a moment. Um, we've, we're seeing a lot in, and, and it, the one, one of the ones I'm looking at is preventative maintenance, so or predictive maintenance. So people are massively able to streamline their predictive maintenance schedules based on reality rather than sort of an average. So if you use this, if you look at the car example, rather than rather than you know get an oil change every 10,000 miles, it's very specific specific to that exact car. Look at a, uh, it's a, it's a FTSE top 100 aviation manufacturer. I'm not going to use the name, not appropriate. Um, they had a couple of drivers. So it was um, leverage predictive analysis and data science in their business. Really, it's all around um, monitoring their product in motion. So this was around a jet engine in motion on, on its flight, monitoring it. And the objectives were predict failures and look at maintenance and, and more, more importantly able to predict when you need to change that oil pump, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing was um, fuel efficiency of that, that flight and that engine and that route so that they could, in effect, um, 
optimizes the fuel consumption of that aircraft. Data collection, IoT sensors. Um, uh, flight aware sensors stream from, a, from an aircraft flying around the world all the time. So we took that data, we took data from the aircraft, which you only get when it lands and docks, because that's when you download it, analyzed it in real time, used that to monitor and predict pending failures and maintenance, and then <coughs> aligned that with the fuel and the fuel used on the route and whether you, how you can optimize that. So can you do a better takeoff, a better land to change fuel consumption of that aircraft and that flight? So um, I've removed some of the stuff because you can see engine numbers and things which I didn't want to show you. Um, but that is flight of aircraft um, around the world, but just at that piece, obviously, to the US. Um, you can look at the KPIs there on what's normal fuel efficiency, what's the utilization. Um, here you've got primary fuel pump, so there's a, an early watch list, so that's when that fuel pump needs changing in 3.45 hours. Um, but it really helps them provide a better service to their customers and also to, I guess, be more profitable, provide a better service to their customers by maintaining their fleet better based on fact and real-time information rather than, oh, it's an average. Final one, there's one of the pumps. So again, you can see all the data for a pump. So in summary, um, the fuel efficiency actually ended up being a, a one that they initially didn't really think as much about, but was probably one of the bigger ones because they had Obviously, they had all the maintenance covered anyway because they've been doing this for years. So they're not, it wasn't about doing something they're not doing. It was just improving it. Um, but it delivered a 20 million pound revenue stream for fuel efficiency. So they spoke to all their other airlines and were able to say, if you change this route, if you change this landing, more about landing and takeoff typically as it happens, um, you can improve your fuel efficiency. Um, we reduce costs through maintenance. Um, the agile engagement was really good there because we had a great understanding of their business objects and uh, objectives and data sets because it often comes down to getting that data in the right format. Um, and it was all stood up in the cloud really quickly, uh, delivered result and scale. And then the big one is there, so cutting fuel uses by 1% per aircraft saves 250,000 pounds. So obviously there's a massive environmental benefit to this because you, you know, you, you're polluting less typically. Uh, but also you're saving money. So the win is for them from a commercial point of view, those airlines, yes, we're using less fuel, 250,000 uh, pounds, but we're polluting the atmosphere less for everybody, which has got to be a good thing. Thank you. Okay, questions and then tea. Any questions? Right, we'll have a tea, coffee, help yourselves. Back in 15 minutes.
for the second part of the uh, IoT showcase. And without further ado, over to Alex, who's going to tell us about Barter for Things, which I am fascinated by. Yes. Hello. Right, so uh, there's one thing more narcissistic than marrying someone who looks like you. That's the name of company after yourself. So my name's Alex Barter, and this is my company, Barter for Things. Uh, we are an IoT-focused uh, company, and as you can maybe detect from my accent, I'm an undeconstructed southerner. Thank you. And today I want some, uh, yeah, I, I need some help, you know, I need to sort of get up north and, you know, bring some of my business and ideas to, to you wonderful folk up north. Now, I have started this journey already. I've been to Watford. Ooh. I've been to Inverness. When I recovered from that, I thought, yeah, I've got to get leads. Right, uh, before I get stuck into the main sort of body of what I'm going to chat about, I mean, there's 40 or 50 slides here. Does anybody not know what an LP1 is? Put your hand up if you don't know what an LP1 is. Oh, grand. Okay. Just indulge us for, for, for one second and I will let you know. Okay, so in there, uh, you know, there's a rule in the world, right? It's quick, cheap, and good. Quick, cheap, good. You can have two things, but you can never have three things. Now, in the world of connectivity, similar things apply. There's a triangle and it's called propagation, data rate, and power. You can have two of those things, but you can't be good at all three. It's the laws of physics. So we used to connect in anything, okay? So in this building, the Wi-Fi is brilliant. Fifth attempt to get onto the guest room. Okay, so, so Wi-Fi is great. It's reasonably low power. You can do Netflix and your Tinder or whatever you do. Um, but when you get down onto, you know, York Street, that's it, Wi-Fi finished. So propagation, not so good. Mobile phone network, one of the wonders of modern times. So, you know, for the sake of argument, mobile phone network, you can get connected anywhere. You can do your Netflix or your Tinder or whatever you do on your, on your phone. But we are used to plugging our phone in and charging up every couple of days. So, data rate good, propagation good, battery life not so good. So, mathematically, there's one set left. So, power, propagation, maybe not such a high data rate. So, this is where LP1 complements Wi Fi, mobile phone, LP1. Okay? It's about connecting but it's about connecting things with super low power, so they last on batteries for years, but also they propagate and they get to the places that other things don't get to. But, sorry guys, on your LP1, no swiping right, no Netflix, day rate's too small. Okay, so LP1, that underpins what my company does. So this, uh, th this graphic here, I'll sort of go through, uh, my journey or my brief history in the internet of things time. So LP1, low power wide area networks, refer to a subset of the internet of things. So the internet of things, we can use like Wi-Fi, mobile and bits of string. LP1 is a subset of IoT. So uh, my company is half a dozen tech goblins we're all ex Ericsson or, or Arkiva. And we're all engineers. And uh, I mean, our collective journey started back about four years ago. I worked for a company called Arkiva. And I was, my job there was to recruit and lead the technology team to kickstart the, the LP WAN experience in the UK. And, you know, to be fair, that didn't go so well. And uh, I'm sure there's some folk from Leeds City Council here who might testify to that. So anyway, uh, so I did a bit in, uh, in Arkiva, 
Uh, we produce some stuff, blah, blah, blah. I remember one day my, uh, my director said, look, you know, what do you, you want to do in this company? And I said, well, I've had a look at the market, and actually I think there's a big opportunity for a systems integrator who focuses on LP1. I said, it's like a school disco out there. You know? You've got the boys lined up one side, that's the technology lot, you know, solutions, shouting about what they do. And you've got the girls on this side, so sitting down, just wanting to talk about the, the problems they've had over the day. And I said, there's a, I think there's a, there's a role for somebody to you know, get in the middle, introduce the right boys to the right girls, put the right records on, do the dance. You know, it gets to 8.30 when the cider comes out and all that sort of stuff. So be careful of what you wish for, because four weeks later, my director said, look, we're, uh, we haven't sold much, so we're going to make your position redundant. And at that moment, it was like, uh, it was like two, it's like a dual feeling. It's like going on the smiler at Alton Towers. You know, it felt like being punched in the stomach. You know, Christ, I'm going to feed the kids. And that didn't go and work. Um, but also, it's that sort of thing that kickstarts you. I always want to start a business. Well, you know, now's the time, buddy. Get on and do it. So, uh, launched, the, launched the company back in 2016, and uh, a few things have happened that have changed the shape and pivoted our business. So, I always wanted to be a systems integrator in, in LP1. I'm strange thing to ask my, uh, my careers advisor at school, but that's what I want to do. Now, one thing that we have done which is accidental is we've become an LP1 network operator in a very, very weird way. So we've built, uh, it says 80, we've actually built 90 LP1 sites to date. Has anybody tried to build an LP1 network themselves? Show of hands. Easy? Correct. Okay. So uh, we, we've built this um, behemoth of a LP1 across my native southern England. And sort of important, you know, like I say, well, I've sort of got past Watford today, you know, just without disintegrating, and I've, I've come up north. I want to share with you what I've done with two very specific customers of mine down south, and I wonder if it's going to resonate with any of the other people in this room. So my two customers, Portsmouth Water, Southampton City Council, Pompey, thanks. So, uh, Portsmouth Water, uh, we're the first company in the UK to deliver smart water metering on LP1. Ooh. You know, it's a, it's a little bit like sort of, you know, winning the, or coming second in the mum and dad's race at, at uh, school sports day. Um, but for Southampton City Council, we've done a whole load of projects. So, we've done stuff in social housing, uh, in and around Legionella detection, uh, I think I heard from Pinnacle, Damp, uh, we, we did this, you know, used the same device. Uh, we did Damp, we did connected fire doors, and something else I can't remember. Uh, we've also delivered a project for the Department for Transport with Southampton City Council and Balfour Beatty in and around, yes, that's right, the national obsession of pothole detection. So we use an LP1 to, to detect potholes. Um, now, why is that interesting to, to you good folk up north? When Southampton, there was no, uh, no government initiative, there was no uh, help from Quangos, there was no, you know, there's no external seeding of why Southampton City Council should use an LP1. Everything we've done has had a business case. Everything is about putting the citizens at the centre of what we do and to deliver better services, help reach our, um, our budget aspirations, but also to you know, go through this whole digital transformation sort of set of activities that are really going to you know, make us match fit for the rest of the 21st century. So Southampton City Council have cared not really for technology, it's been about the results, about the financial results. Over in Pompey, 
Portsmouth Water, the same thing. So the, the, the water industry in the UK, uh, there are some real sort of movers and shakers. You know, there's you know, Seven Trent, Anglian Water, I was like, Yorkshire Water. You know, the, the, uh, the companies are very innovative around what they're doing uh, in water, meeting leakage and data and all, and all sort of stuff. Portsmouth Water, if you'd take a, a pub analogy, you'd have, you know, Seven Trent, and Yorkshire and Anglia and all at the bar drinking cocktails and having fun. And Portsmouth Water would be sat in the corner with a pint of mild and a racing post, you know, sitting quietly, you know, doing nothing. So within 15 months, Portsmouth Water went from the, you know, the proverbial guy in the corner to delivering the UK's first smart metering project on LP1, delivering the world's first pressure detection system using LP1 with a specific aim of combating leakage, which is a key UK government smart infrastructure uh, objective, 9.1 or something like that. So Portsmouth Water, everything they've done has been about they're putting their client at the centre of what they do for their smart metering. It's been about meeting their, um, their regulatory compliance in how they're measuring uh, pressure and leakage. And they're using LP1 because there's a business case behind it and it makes sense. So I'm just going to sort of pause there for a second because I just want that to sink in. Okay. This LP1 technology, it's real. And it absolutely answers business cases for people who look exactly like you in this room. Okay. I've said enough. Paul, shall I stop? Because if I don't, I'll carry on. Hello? Yeah, there we go. Um, questions? Put one over there. Uh, any other questions? I've got a question. So your LP1 is what? Uh, is that a things network? Is it a, uh, what was the, what's the, I'm not sure one, digital catapults one, things connected. What infrastructure are you using? Who cares? <laughs> No, no, I say this, I need to move this conversation on right now. I've been in this, uh, this echo cham chamber of LP1 for like you know, five or six years now. And I've been sort of asked about you know, the various merits of NBIoT and LoRaWAN and, and, and Sigfox. Now, it is true that we use Sigfox. Um, I have personally built LoRaWAN networks. And I know the ins and outs of MBIOT to, to a working level. So yes, we use Sigfox to, to answer your so question. So you're saying Paul. it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. That's the, uh, it's yeah. all about business case. Forget standards and protocols, because it's nonsense. Okay, use what you've got to your hands and let the business case drive what you do. Good, so there's no vendor lock-in or anything like that? I'll do what I want. Right. My sites. Perfect. For, so for the clients as well? So they locked into you? I hope so. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's business, now we right? get to it. Now we get to it. I, you know, I've got to keep yeah. myself in hair product, right? You know, so, yeah. uh, right. Fine. So that we, we've, we've, we're good. Any other questions? So we could just wait for the microphone. Who are you and what's your question? Uh, Dr. Leonard Anderson, Kem Uri, and I knew Alex from a long time ago. Um, can you say something about the cost of LP1 versus other alternative techniques? Uh, absolutely, Leonard, it's a, uh, it, it's a good question. So, uh, you know, there, there, there's an absolute cost in LP1, which means, you know, if, if we need to nibble away uh, you know, mobile connectivity and pinch a bit of business from there, as we've done in Portsmouth with something I can't really tell you about. Um, then yes, there's a you know th there's an exact sort of uh, connectivity metric, 
Uh, but more than that, as you, as you delve into what LP1 can actually help you deliver, about connecting things on battery power for years, but it is a managed connection. So it's not the wild west of Wi-Fi, okay? But it's also the ability to stick a couple of AA batteries in something, put something anywhere that mobile doesn't get to. So I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll share my my first project uh, with uh, with Portsmouth Water. You know, is there any there's a few RF engineering geeky types in here? Yes? No? Okay, all right, fair enough. Um, yeah, our, our, our first project was to connect something underground with a metal lid on it in a damp condition with water pouring all over the place. Now, if you try and connect something using mobile underground, good luck. If you put a metal lid over anything, you know, if you sort of like, you're getting a lift and it's, yeah, hi, man. <laughs> okay, so anything with metal, uh, you know, that's very difficult. So LP1, because of how it transmits, remember the triangle, propagation, data, power, because of what we can do in the propagation and power part of that triangle in LP1, that gets us out of those difficult places to reach. So the answer is it's cheaper. In yes. Well, yes. <laughs> It, sh it should be more efficient and, and cheaper, and, and that's why lots of people are using it. So, unfortunately, we've run out of time, Alex, because of the answer to that question. Um, but round of applause, and I think <laughs> you can find these guys on the web. Alex is going to be around. If you want to find out about more about LP1, ask Alex. So, who's next? Andrea, microphone. If you can introduce yourself, yeah. use the clicker, and there we go. So, good morning, everyone. I'm Andrea DeSantis from San Dias. Uh, my business partner, Jujar, is sitting uh, over there. And today I'm going to talk to you about how to combine Internet of Things with uh, engineering simulations. Uh, so a few words about, uh, about us. Uh, Sandy S is a, is a newborn company. We are based in Leeds and we, are, we focus on uh, Industry 4.0. Uh, specifically, we provide uh, digital engineering simulations. Uh, this is to help uh, our customers to accelerate innovation and also to increase the efficiency of their uh, products. Uh, we are also involved in the de development of uh, IoT sensors uh, with industry, and we have a strong uh, expertise, especially in uh, nuclear industry and consumer goods as well. Um, so a quick overview on uh, Industry 4.0. Uh, this concept basically uh, revolves around these nine uh, concepts. Uh, they are, all of them are strongly interlinked with each other, and the output is basically the, de the development of smart products for industry, uh, such as uh, smart machines or even smart uh, factories. And as you can see, both uh, simula simulations and IoT are in, are in there. Uh, together with other stuff such as uh, big data, uh, cloud computing, or uh, augmented uh, reality as well, which is my favorite one because uh, gave us uh, Pokemon Go two years ago. Um, but as a person who is uh, specialized in, uh, uh, in simulations but who uh, doesn't have like a very strong background in Industry 4.0 and Internet of Things. To me, uh, when I was uh, reading and studying about this kind of stuff, it was uh, fascinating to see how did we get there. And uh, computers and simulations were basically introduced 
into industry during what is called the third industrial revolution and they, they will still play a very big uh, role in the fourth industrial revolution which is which is ongoing uh, so for uh, those of you that are not familiar with uh, uh, digital engineering simulations uh, this slide will give uh, just a very uh, short overview so basically digital simulations or computer-aided engineering um, revolves around computer-aided design and around simulations of different phenomena. So for example, the workhorses of uh, digital simulations in Industry 3.0 were basically computational fluid dynamics. I think the name is pretty much uh, self-explanatory. So it's the simulation of everything which involves the movement of, of fluids. And we also have uh, finite element analysis, which is uh, more concerned with the simulation of uh, the behavior of solid uh, structures. Uh, again, this is a very, quick, a very quick overview, and there is much more to digital engineering uh, simulations than just that. For example, you can consider the coupling between CFD and finite element analysis. If you have a two-way coupling between fluid and structures, you can actually simulate fluid structure interactions and how these two things interact with each other. Uh, another application which perhaps is more relevant to IoT is uh, the simulation of electromagnetism. For example, basically all the sensors that I've been hearing about today they rely on antennas and wireless system. And digital simulations can tell you what is, for example, the optimal distribution of antennas inside a given environment or uh, stuff like that. Um, so uh, what is the link between uh, IoT and, uh, and simulations? Uh, well, IoT is, uh, relatively speaking, an a new thing, and it poses a lot of uh, engineering challenges. Uh, I've been heard about s some of these challenges in the uh, presentations before, and we identified these four points that are uh, very important when engineering the IoT infrastructure, which are reliability, precision, robustness, and uh, innovation, and hopefully, all of this should be achieved at a manageable cost. And for me, again, as a simulation engineer, it was uh, satisfactory to see that uh, engineering simulations are basically universally regarded as a critical uh, tool to successfully deliver uh, the Internet of Things uh, infrastructure. Um, and to give you an idea on how uh, digital simulations can help in the development and the deployment of uh, IoT, uh, we have performed a simple uh, case study, which is basically the flow of fluid over a heated cube, which can be emitting heat for any reason. And uh, this is a fairly simple uh, case study, which is used as a benchmark in the, in the literature, uh, but you can also think as a simplified uh, representation of what happens, for example, in your laptop when the CPU is heating up and the cooling fan is basically sucking in uh, cool air to cool down uh, the CPU. This is wha what's happening. And uh, again, digital uh, simulations can give us very useful insights about what's going on there without having to, uh, I don't know, build like a physical prototype of what, you're going, what you want to, to realize. Uh, so uh, the kind of output that we can get from uh, um, a simulation of this case, uh, for example, we can have an idea of how the flow field will uh, evolve in our device. Uh, for example, in this case, you can see uh, that basically this is a velocity map where the red colors correspond to high velocity 
blue colors correspond to low velocities. You can see that as the flow that is coming in impinges on the cube, which can be your uh, CPU, you have low velocity regions uh, which will basically lead to a less effective cooling. Uh, and that can be problematic for, for, for the CPU or for the sensor. And also what this uh, nice animation is showing uh, are these, uh, technically these are called uh, co coherent turbulent structures. These are basically vortices which are generated by the impact of the flow uh, on, the, um, on, on the cube. And you can see that these structures are generated at a very regular interval and this can have a big impact on other properties which are more of an engineering interest in this case. For example, pressure and temperature. We can have an idea on what like the temperature will be of the sensor. We can also have an idea of what the pressure fluctuations are going to be. And this has like a direct impact on the design of this thing. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, simulations can really help to um, find answers to very critical uh, design questions in a very quick and also cost-effective way. Uh, if we imagine that uh, this cube is a sensor, uh, a relatively simple simulation like this one can already give you some extremely valuable information, for example, in terms of the operating conditions in which the sensor is going to be um, operating, but also about the durability of the sensor that we are, uh, that we are uh, designing. Because of course, the durability is directly linked to the environment in which the sensor is, is operating. Uh, another thing that simulations can help um, to, to do is to place the sensor in an optimal location inside a given environment. Uh, for example, I've been hearing about um, CO2 sensors to be placed inside uh, homes, but what is like a sensible location for a CO2 sensor? You can run a quick simulation of the room, and you can see where you can expect the highest CO2 concentration or low CO2 concentration or pockets of CO2. Uh, and finally, uh, if you trust your simulations enough, you can also use the numerical results to perform basically a sanity check on what is the output of the sensor. Um, so to conclude this small, uh, this small overview, uh, I would like to point out that engineering simulations have been around for a long time now, and they are a proven technology, they are mature and they are reliable. And since the development of IoT poses extremely difficult challenges, simulations can be regarded as an extremely valuable tool to help to engineer the future of IoT. And this is especially true if we consider the possible integration between simulations and other stuff such as big data and cloud computing. And there is also a trend of uh, democratization of simulations, which means that it's now possible to perform at least basic simulations online on the cloud. And so it is reasonable to expect that uh, more and more people will pick up di digital simulations as a tool uh, to help them design IoT devices. And uh, so this is, uh, this is all, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to take them. Thank you, Dan. So, um, thanks very much, that's fascinating. One of the things we see a lot here is the way in which the world has changed from it used to cost a lot of money to collect data. So people used to pay lots of people lots of money to write models that were basically less wrong than other things. So the models were always wrong. Now we're seeing that the fact that we can get collect lots more data, we can have simple sim simulations or simulations that, as you said, were democratized yeah. and shared and then improved. 
um, it's a massive challenge for the people who used to write models or the people who used to, re um, I guess, um, rely on models to, to do what they're doing. And that's another way in which IoT is, is uh, disrupting and smashing into the old models of, uh, of doing work and doing business. So that's my little point. Um, any questions? Is anyone using simulations as well as models or data? Wow. Andrea, you've got away with it. Yeah, so final <laughs> round of applause. Yeah. Thanks very much. So who's next? Steve, you knew before me who was on event, didn't you? So we've got Steve from Save9. He's going to introduce himself. He's brought water and a bag. Very good. I've Over to you, Steve. Introduce yourself. Um, you've got a clicker. Clicker, please. Yeah. There you go. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's uh, Steve Bromham. I'm from Save9. Uh, I've got a couple of colleagues with me here today as well. Uh, one person in particular is Rebecca, Rebecca Nettleship. Uh, she's a theoretical physicist and is working with us um, on a program to help us uh, look at the different types of sensor technologies at a more technical level. Um, presentation today really is about our journey. Uh, Save9 is a 2002 established business that provides IT and network solutions. And we, we got to a position where we were asked about broadband facilities where we are, where we are based, the locale, which is on the east coast of Yorkshire. We're based in Scarborough, and uh, there's a rural landscape out there with terrible broadband connectivity. So we started uh, basically getting into the networking business initially by working with a rural uh, broadband initiative program uh, through a company called Ninet. Now, Ninet is wholly owned by North Yorkshire County Council, and they came to us and said, right, guys, you know quite a bit about network connectivity and managing data. Can you help us out? We want to report to multiple public sector locations the quality of the, uh, the network connectivity that we're putting in for them. Now, Nina, it was uh, EU funded, big project uh, all over North Yorkshire, from the East Coast, from Scarborough up to Whitby, cross towards Harrogate, Ripon, back down again, York, cross to uh, Moulton, back again, a big ring, a big fiber network. And we basically set up an open source solution in MySQL, which is a, a, a database package now uh, owned by, uh, the license is owned by uh, Oracle. Uh, but at the time it wasn't. And uh, when, when we set it up, we managed to track live uh, packets of data from Cisco routers at 50, 563 locations. And that generated about 19 million records uh, of data. So we had some experience in, 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 in data right at an early stage in, in actually analyzing it and presenting it in a nice GUI for a network manager or an IT manager at, say, a hospital or uh, perhaps based at a, at a council office. So that's what um, we started off doing. Well, we moved office and we got to this beautiful Georgian villa called Woodend. Uh, this is where we used to be based our office. And uh, the reason why we moved there is we needed more connectivity. And they had uh, a Ninet link in there, funnily enough. And it was a government-funded project. So we had lots and lots of bandwidth we could play with. Um, someone found out about the fact we had lots of bandwidth. In fact, it was a, a hotel, again, on the coast. And I'd mentioned already, internet's pretty awful uh, in rural locations generally. It's getting better, of course, thanks to Ninet and super fast initiatives. But this hotel really needed better broadband for its guests because people were actually checking online and the hotel booking websites to uh, the, the speed of the internet connectivity, and they were losing money. They were losing bookings. So we said, well, yeah, we've got a link uh, we could potentially do. We've not done it before. We've done a bit of Wi-Fi for, for, for companies uh, and for public sector organizations, and they, they asked us to do a, a feed for them because the cost, I think it was going to cost 20K just to put a leased line in, just the capital costs, civil engineering costs, to put it into that hotel. So we did it uh, for a lot less than that. And um, we did a link, wireless point-to-point -point link, and we managed to give them about uh, 450 meg throughput. Um, they didn't use all of that, but we had the capacity. And uh, it was quite a good experience, because from the back of that, the council found out that we were doing it, and they said, oh, well, we're not far from there. We've got this uh, big uh, visitor center called the Spa Complex. Our internet's pretty terrible, too. So we said, oh, right, okay. So we bounced a link off the, the hotel. Can you all see it at the top? 
That's the hotel I showed you earlier. And we bounced the link down to there. So before we knew it, we'd actually built this wireless network. Then the open air theater, they had terrible internet too. So some said to us, look, you guys do internet to uh, the hotel and you do internet to this, uh, the spa complex. We need it too. Um, before we knew it, we were building this wireless network, point to point links uh, across the town of Scarborough. Um, so we thought, just a minute, there could be some money in this. So we decided to go and buy some land. And on that land uh, was a, an old Yorkshire water reservoir, which had been imploded and closed down. So we bought a mast and some land. And uh, here's one of my guys on our mast. Um, somebody mentioned Arkiva. It was Barter, wasn't it? You probably recognize that. That's a red zone mast as well. You're not supposed to go near it. And if you go up, you have to go up with two people at a time. It's that bad, the, 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 the intensity of the RF uh, waves up there is pretty awful. So we can't spend too much time on our mast, by the way, when we're near the Arkiva mast. Uh, someone had the idea as well recently to put one of those, uh, like a London Eye up there, similar sort of concept, one of those roving wheels, and they had no idea what they were going to uh, cause in terms of medical problems for their customers, but we won't go into that. Microwave their customers. So um, this is uh, Southview. We've, we can see for miles. I think you can probably get the gist of this. So we've suddenly opened up our entire network as a fixed wireless internet provider. So um, that's to the south of our first tower. That's to the north of our uh, tower. And now we're rolling out other towers and I'm putting in license agreements, not heavy duty legal contracts like leases with farmers, landowners, and we're building up a network of towers across the East Coast. Uh, we're extending into caravan parks, building base stations, and I'm going to get to the point soon, ladies and gentlemen, but what I'm trying to show you all here is we have an infrastructure, and off the back of that infrastructure, we can now offer, and we want to work, because at the beginning of this journey, we're right at the beginning of the IoT journey, this is what we hope to do. We hope to deliver on our two primary masts, which are about 20 meters tall, uh, a LP1 connections uh, to sensors. And the sensors that we are thinking of delivering, we use the same business model that we used with the tourism industry. It was our locale, it was the open air theater, it was the hotel, it's the, the B and B's that we serve, it's the uh, farmers who are in the agricultural settings around us that we're serving, we're providing high speed internet to. We see a lot of flooding problems. You've probably uh, seen stuff at uh, York or Moulton couple of places in North Yorkshire that frequently, every couple of years, suffer terrible floods. So we reckon we're in a prime position because of our location to help out. Because of our rural positions of our, our base stations and our towers, we believe that we can start looking at the tributaries to these rivers to say, look, here are some, here are pieces of data, patterns of behavior in perhaps the flow of water and the height of liquids that give an indicator perhaps to authorities or interested parties or even businesses who just want to know if their premises are at risk or their warehouse is going to flood. Giving them ideas that uh, working with partners who have got the technologies and experience in delivering this to actually provide real value. So that's where we are at the beginning of our journey. Um, we, we're, we have so many inquiries now. Uh, we get quite a lot of landowners and farmers saying, look, I need internet. And these lease agreements that we have with them uh, help us on our journey and I've just gone and uh, bought three ex-military masts. Now this quite high-end kit, um, if you imagine the back of a lorry, it, they use ISO containers and ISO containers have got a set size because they're designed to be delivered from a lorry to a ship, from the ship to a docking port, from the port back onto another lorry, anywhere in the world. Now these containers were deliberately designed by Clark Masts um, as a container base using an ISO base. So we can use a lorry to ship them anywhere very quickly to set up temporary masts. So if you're interested in working with us on a pilot project on IoT, please give me a shout. We've got masts we can have up in a field within a few hours if you think about it, provided we can get that uh, lorry to pick it up, a low loader, and then we can get these masts erected within minutes. They're, uh, they're based upon a, uh, basically an air, air regulator can pressure, pressure the mast, air pressure pushes it up to the top, lock it down, you have a, a, a ready-made mast with a very stable base. Um, so you can evaluate, do IoT pilot projects that might last months or even years, or even turn it into a fixed mast implementation with uh, some concrete blocks. And the idea is you weigh it down with either sand 
or cement blocks to keep it stable so we don't want it falling over. Um, I wanted to just use this, um, this image to give you an indication of the kind of impact that uh, water levels can have on business and tourism and uh, having advance notice of it can really save a lot of uh, uh, a cost to, to companies such as a pub for example. Now a lot of these guys in York, this is a picture of, uh, of York on the River Ouse and can you just pay particular attention please just to the, the height of the, the fence and the bollards and all the people where they all currently are and this, this pub here which you may have frequented in York, just think, just look at the, the level of the, uh, the pavement in relation to the windows. And this is, what, this is what happens when the river floods. Now, a lot of these businesses are all geared up for this. They don't keep anything in stock below the, the waterline, basically. The water levels go higher than this. They actually do go up to about here. We've seen it before when they've been in York at that level. Now, we just feel that if we can give advance notice well in advance, not hours, but perhaps a week in advance, uh, because of the changes and circumstances in water levels, we reckon we can add some real value. But not in the city. We're not a smart city specialist. We're in the rural areas, remember. That's where our infrastructure is. But we do have a, a belief that there's a, there's a feeder to these rivers that stem from high ground, and that's where we think we can help. Now, we do see a lot of flooding as well, um, particularly in Yorkshire, a leakage. It was mentioned already by a few of you. And uh, having sensors uh, distributed is uh, quite a handy way of actually detecting uh, water leaks much earlier. And it was a, a barter I had mentioned, actually. It was a great, great point. Um, some of the technologies like 3G, 4G, they're just terrible for sensors in the ground. You only have to put it a, a few centimeters above the ground, and you're, you're suddenly destroying the propagation quality of that signal. But the thing about the LoRaWAN or LP, other LP1 technologies is you can actually start putting them under grates. Um, and there's some technologies out there which we're looking at already, we've actually purchased. And it's amazing how many people don't realize what the actual kit looks like, so I've brought some with me. And um, this, this is what a gateway looks like, which is essentially the equipment that all of the hundreds or even thousands of sensors communicate with. That's it. Now on that is a network server as well. So you don't really need to have, if you don't want to, uh, an actual cloud service provider. You can capture all of the data on this device and then forward it to a, a system that you have in, in, in your office if you needed to. It just so happens it does have a packet forwarding option where you can send the data onto a cloud provider. And we, we kicked off this equipment um, using the, the Things Network, which is an open source um, network which you can try out sensors to, to test your prototyping. Um, before we knew it, we had to actually advance that and move on to uh, a more private environment, which I'll explain in a minute. But um, again, that's one of our guys on our tower, and you can deploy sensors uh, in the field quite easily, and the batteries last for years, but it all depends upon how often you're sending data from the device. The, more, the, the higher the frequency of the data packets that you're sending, the lower the battery life. So this is a kit uh, you've just seen. <laughs> But if we need to mount these out in the uh, rural landscapes high up on towers, we need to make sure that they're IP rated so that the water, the dust, the, the high temperatures, the low temperatures don't damage this important kit. So there's some equipment that we're uh, evaluating now before we actually launch our first three base stations. As I mentioned, we're very, very early on, but we've got all the theory sorted out. We've got the net network testing, the data capture, the analyzing of the data as well. And so we're ready to roll with some partners who want to work with us. Um, this is quite a useful diagram uh, because it explains the simplicity of sensor deployments. You can buy a base unit, this tiny little unit in the middle of the screen, which is where you, where you put your uh, sensor connector to. So you might have a, um, an ultrasonic sensor like the one in this photograph in the middle. We attach it via just a three cables. You seal up the unit by putting the screws on the unit and you deploy it. You might want a water level sensor, you might want a pressure sensor, a temperature, a thermometer all the different types of sensors out there, some cheap and nasty ones, someone's mentioned that I had experiences of that, bad experiences, beware, you get what you pay for. We happen to use really good LoRaWAN uh, transmission devices from a company called Elsys in, in Sweden. Fantastic, pretty good on price, but very, very um, useful because you can connect to digital or analog inputs on the different sensors that you buy. So. The idea is to minimize our costs as we deploy. We buy a single type of unit. You can get higher antenna units as well. Uh, I've got one with me if you want to see an actual live one. 
because um, you'd be amazed people think they're the size of shoe boxes, but they're not. So this is an ultrasonic one, ultrasonic sensor. And the idea is you can mount it under a bridge uh, or perhaps an overhang and it points down on the water. And the accuracy of this is it can measure water levels uh, in whatever uh, interval, time interval you want, but roughly one millimeter accuracy per meter. So if you do a 10 meter, have it really quite high up on a fixed point and just constantly tracking and monitoring the, the height of the liquid below it. So that's the kind of size. And again, that lasts years on a, on a lithium battery. Okay. Um, there are some other devices which you can use, for example, uh, subterrain. So this is a, a particularly useful one. Very clever. This is detective if, if a manhole cover has been moved, either because displacement by water or because of uh, somebody actually breaking in and trying to see what's in the, in the drain. So that's quite good for security. This particular product is, is fascinating because they've used the, um, the switch. All it is is a switch, that lever. They've used that as the actual antenna as well. So it's a great idea. Some innovation out there on the sensors you need to look out for. Here's one we've developed, a very cheap uh, and cheerful water flow detector. We've got some ideas around that. We've been experimenting with that by connecting it up to one of our LSIS transmitters. We, c we think um, it would be quite useful in sports fields where they do a lot of use of water. Um, for example, cricket. we're in a cricket club. We, we lease a floor where our office space is. So we've got monitoring of, water in the, uh, of the use of water at the cricket field. Where there isn't Wi-Fi, they don't want to put a 3G or 4G connection in because it's in a bad, uh, a bad signal area, perhaps. And this kind of thing allows you to, to uh, do micro-metering, uh, smart metering. There's lots of software products out there. It's, it's, there's a glut of it. You've probably all used a lot of them yourselves. Um, some really popular ones, but one of the ones we like that you pay for, unfortunately, not one of the freebie ones, uh, is this product, and it's the uh, WMW, and it's got some fantastic user interfaces. And from our perspective, we want to make it easy for the end user. We want to make their experience quick and easy. Just log on to a portal. There it is. It all makes sense. Nothing complicated. And that's a particular product we, uh, we like. And there's another... Um, company. This is, this is a proprietary package as well. It's all to do with water. You probably sense there's a bit of a focus here on water uh, uh, monitoring and, and management. But these guys are really on the ball. Uh, they've actually got a satellite imaging system whereby, I mean, it's, it's not their own software. They've, they've brought it in. But they have a technology where the satellites are actually taking photographs, a high resolution, extreme high resolution of uh, the landscape. Again, typically rural landscapes at the moment. And they're then superimposing uh, you, uh, interval photographs. So if you can imagine staged photographs at a set interval from the satellite. And then they uh, use some uh, artificial intelligence to look at the differences between the photographs and they're actually detecting leaks using satellite imagery. It's very, very fascinating. And they have this um, software suite, uh, which is the Aqua Advanced. Uh, I've been invited down to Bristol to look at their operation. I'm looking forward to that. And that particular software package does a lot of what the other packages out there uh, do. But one of the things we became acutely aware of discussing with businesses who are interested in monitoring assets and people and, uh, is that they don't want to have a different app for every type of sensor deployment they've got. And that is going to be the biggest challenge with already thousands of options out there. People do not want to go to a different portal every hour. They want to have one pane of glass to look at. And so these guys have cottoned onto it. So the, the, the chaps at Suez have come up with a system that allows you to integrate really sophisticated radio telemetry systems into a less sophisticated rapid deployment IoT solutions based on LP ones. Um, and these are a couple of screenshots. So they're very clever uh, in terms of how they're approaching their, um, their business model and selling their software solutions to the water industries. Um, and there are some particularly impressive providers out there which, um, which have got very highly calibrated measuring instruments, sensors, which are um, LoRaWAN compatible, and again, LoRaWAN tends to be a stack that we're particularly comfortable with. Uh, and these are the sorts of readings that you can, you can take from uh, water. Uh, so, for example, you can look at the acidity levels, um, you can look at the ions uh, at very granular level, at the, the chemical, the chemistry of, of the water that you're monitoring remotely. Um, but what's critical about this is there's no point being able to do that unless the accuracy of those sensors is, is, is very high, uh, scientifically calibrated almost. Um, you can get a lot of cheerful, cheap and cheerful sensors out there that just won't, won't cut the mustard. And this is where we think we're going to find our uh, opportunities. Um, the, the 
I deliberately put these map point pins on because I wanted to give a, a, you a, a sense where we think it's going to go. With our masts being high up on uh, strategic locations so that we can deliver fixed wireless internet and IoT, we are uh, going to be putting high resolution 4K cameras on these masts. Uh, they aren't, we, we hope they're not going to be too intrusive because of their position high up, so there's no privacy issues there, we believe. Uh, but the idea is that if we use augmented um, systems where the sensor data is represented by icons on a landscape and a user can click on that particular icon uh, and get information, the visual side of things isn't just bells and whistles and making the GUI look lovely. It's about people being able to see the environment. So if they are looking at a floodplain, they've got a visual impression of what's going on, and then they can click on a sensor to see a level of a reservoir. So that's our concept. We think that's where it's going ahead. And then w the concept of hyperlinking, we're all used to it in web pages, but we think that's where it's heading to, where you'll be able to look at a sensor, click on the sensor, and it hyperlinks to it, so it takes you to perhaps a visual. And I have to state that LoRaWAN is not good for sending images. It's terrible. Uh, but the idea is that you might use other types of image capture devices in the vicinity. Um, again, going back to the original start of this presentation, our business was set up around the local economy, the rural economy, the, uh, the tourism industry. And just to finish off, uh, I think that we'll be able to help people who are thinking of, for example, going to tourist resorts, who look at the smartphone and they say, oh, tomorrow or this afternoon it says it's going to be a downpour, it's going to be grey skies, I mean, how many people here have looked at an app, please put your hands up, and they've told you the weather's terrible where you are, but in reality, it's beautiful sunshine. Lots of you. And so what we feel is that sometimes these, these IoT solutions will allow you to look at the temperature, look at the sunshine levels, get a visual, and you want to look what it's like down on the beach, click on the link, click on the hyperlink to the base station looking over the beach. Tap on it, there you are, you've got a visual. That's it, thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much. That's a fascinating talk, and, and I think it's a little bit about what's happening now and, and the future. That's great. I grew up in Scarborough, so I'm really, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Um, we also need to put you in touch with ICAST for people who were here yesterday. So uh, there's ICAST, which is about the, a whole Yorkshire wide monitoring of water catchments. So we need to put you in touch with them. Any questions? Right, we've got one there, we've got one there from Steve. Anyone else? Well, we're talking, um, if you've spotted our um, IoT um, Things Network gateway on the window, but we have, we, if you press the button when you're getting a cup of coffee or tea, we, that goes on our website and tells you how many we've had in here. But we did that to see if we could link it all together. But yes, if you can make sure you press the button uh, in the same way that Steve's doing with his experiments. So, Steve, question? Hi there, Steve James from Bradford Council. Uh, the first is a point rather than a question. Um, our next use case, we're looking um, at putting gateways on street posts, street lamp columns. So we've got 60,000 of them. So yeah. you don't need to necessarily install, so have a word with local authorities if you get to that situation. Um, the other one is um, on um, dashboards and the likes. It's considering where the sensors are, the, the types of sensor, but also operationally, the people who are likely to need access to that data they also will be using non-sensor stuff, so they'll be getting cases in from their CRM systems here, there, and everywhere, so there needs to be a consideration about not necessarily one dashboard for all their sensors, but how that can link in with the other activities that they need to do that's non-sensor based. Thank you. And there's a question over here. Any other questions? Great, next one. And then Hi Steve, thanks for the presentation. I'm uh, Juja Harpanisar from CentDS. So a few of the things that you're measuring is actually quite sensitive. Uh, stuff like turbidity, you know, iron content, pH, stuff like that. And like you rightly mentioned, a lot of the stuff you buy off the shelf, they're rubbish. Um, the, the, you know, you, you buy five identical sensors, the, the spread on them will be plus or minus 100%. Right. So, and quite often, what 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 we find is, it's it's because they're not being well calibrated. Now, if you've got a a hundred of these sensors scattered all over the place, 
what are you doing to actually say, all right, you know what, the, the reading that that sensor is giving you is correct. How, what are you doing for your sanity check? How are you zeroing in and eliminating your errors? It's a very good point, um, which you picked up on. Here's an example of a, a water level sensor. Uh, this is a thermostatic one. Um, the accuracy on it could be a couple of centimeters out quite easily. So uh, what you have to do, I think, if you're deploying them, is you have to be the responsible party. And I think you need to calibrate them before an actual on-site deployment too. So it's quite easy to calibrate one of these. You can stick it in a bucket of water and then look at the reading, the sensor value, and if it doesn't match what it says on there, you can either change it, but then that's accurate at that point in time. But if you fill that bucket of water even further, it could be even more inaccurate. So you have to make sure you're buying decent kit that you've tried and tested, not just one, which might be a lucky one, but you've got to be a responsible party, I think. Pre-calibration and then calibration in the field, that's what I would suggest. Just, just to add to your point, what we found is that uh, when, we, when we look at these sensors, um, you know, you can do a lot of calibration, but generally speaking, um, this, this is gonna touch on what Andrea mentioned in his presentation uh, a few presentations ago. But uh, if, you, if you do couple it with you know, stuff like simulations or whatever, then you, you, you definitely do get that sanity check. So I was just wondering if you did do any of that, but uh, it's nice to hear that uh, you're also having the same uh, problems we were having, misery loves company. <laughs> In reality, we're too, too early stage to, to have done that level of, sort of calibration and, and field, but I, I would imagine it's like most metering systems that do need to be calibrated at intervals, depending upon the reliability or mean time before failure. So if you see MTBF, that's a specification you need to look out for um, because that's when it's, it's going to start deteriorating and might start giving inaccurate results towards the, 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 the expected failure of that sensor. Alex. Here you go. Um, <clears throat> totally agree with your point. Cheap sensors, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, uh, Steve, I totally get what you're doing. Um, you know, we've got a flooding thing at the moment. We're not, you know, technology is great, but uh, the practicality is where the rubber hits the road. That's, that's different if you're stealing stuff like that. Um, but what the point I want to make is in the world of IoT and specifically the subset LP1, we're really thinking about lots and lots of data points. We're effectively crowdsourcing our data. It's just that we create the crowd. Now, um, if you want a really good sensor, cost money, maybe that's not so much an IoT thing, maybe that's more of an M2M uh, type application. But IoT does have a, what is it, you know, there's a mantra about it. You know, it's very, very low cost, crowdsource things. So um, without hijacking your, your bit, Steve, we're, we're doing pothole detection and we're crowdsourcing our own data by putting super cheap sensors in loads of council vehicles. And they're going around, and we know that the data's a bit wonky in places. But if you've got lots and lots of data, then we put regression models and training data around what we're collecting. And all the rubbish soon sort of like fades away. And as we're crowdsourcing data, I think this is in, in, into your world, right, machine learning. You know, we can, make, we can make best use of the data that way. So cheap data in, contemporary machine learning techniques, super low cost, crappy sensors, is the way forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I think Just one more point. I think, um, I think every AOT thing I've got to, especially when you mentioned every time, lack of affordable indicator sensors, as opposed to high value calibrated air this afternoon, that's a gotcha. Uh, just for the live stream, oh, just for the live stream. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so basically, it's um, yeah, I mean, if you deploy a thousand air temperatures to give you an indicator around a city, as opposed to one that gives you an a accurate, calibrated result, which would you prefer, indicators or actual results? So one of the things we've come across a lot of time is things about road temperature, a council or a, a customer would want to see 30 street, streets measured as an indicator rather than an actual true figure. So going back to your point is LP1 is more indication rather than accurate data you want every hour. 0.01% you prefer to pay 30,000 pounds for that sensor, you're gonna put a SIM card in, are you? Rather than LP1, so 
my feeling is L.1 is what you say, it's indicators rather than true data. So. Thank you. Yeah. So we're, we're running miles behind. So um, we've got two more talks just to go through. But thanks very much. Thanks. And we'll, we'll crack on to conversations. That's brilliant. Yeah. So while well, the uh, slides have been put up, uh, my name's Neil Hall. I'm from Dales Landlet. And uh, really, just to keep the, uh, the flooding thing going, I'm going to talk a little bit about our interest in flooding and predicting flooding. Uh, myself and my, my colleague here, Peter Jersey, uh, we should be here today and tomorrow, so let's have a bit of a discussion about it. Thank you. Oops. So um, I got interested in flooding back in about 2015, 2016, when that big flood hit, the A Valley in particular. I remember wa walking out down there, uh, down the road where I live and watching the, the torrent of water going down the air and wondering why on earth nobody knew that was going to happen. Watching pictures of caravans floating down the air, smacking into bridges in salt air, thinking that's cost a lot of money. Why did nobody ever know that was going to happen? Um, so I started digging into the problem and, and looking at what was out there. Um, and what I really found very quickly is predicting flooding is very expensive. Um, but of course it's even more expensive when it goes wrong. Um, the current methods that are out there tend to rely very much on uh, river level measurements, borehole level measurements, and statistical models developed by the Environment Agency. And they base those on about 2,000 data points that they collect from across England. They feed that into some statistical models. They come out with uh, rainwater saturation models that they then feed into other statistical models to try and get an answer as to when flooding is going to happen. And then they let us all know by text. They're doing their best but they don't have very much in the way of ground truth information that's coming into them in a real-time environment. So it's very expensive and it's very slow to respond. The damages that those 2015-2016 floods caused were summarized in a report at the beginning of this year, in January, by the EA themselves. And that came to 1.6 billion. That's a huge amount of damage. I looked at just how much car park damage, you know, vehicles floating around in car parks, that was 38 million across the United Kingdom, just for that one flooding event. If you go back and you start looking at other big impacts as well, then you've got the, the agricultural sector as well. That hu suffers huge losses every time there's, there's big flooding. 400 million in the 2010-2012 period. So what's the problem? Why is it hard to do? Well, the problem actually turns out not to be the rainfall. It actually turns out to be how much water is already in the ground. It's either too wet or it's too dry and flooding will start. You'll get runoff from from a heavy rainfall on wet ground because nothing can soak in. You get a flash flood from runoff from a, a dry ground because nothing can soak in. So there's this kind of narrow band where everything will soak through and make its way into the natural water courses. And there's a lot of understanding about that happens, but what it turns out is understanding the soil moisture itself is the difficult bit because there's no real ground truth information coming back from that. So this soil moisture is actually very critical to flooding. It's also very critical to the agriculture industry as well. You know, it's obvious. If your crops have not got enough water in the ground, they're going to suffer. Their quality goes down. The market price of those goes down. They suffer from diseases, pests, etc. So it becomes very important in the farming community to understand just how much is there. And a lot of that farming community is in the upper level catchment areas of the areas that suffer from flooding. So there's quite a close link between the farming community and what's happening with flooding. So what we started to do is look at developing um, a large area sensor network for monitoring groundwater and soil moisture out there. It needs to be a large network. It needs to be something that can capture it from the farming communities, capture it from the upper level catchment that the flooding communities and the flooding modeling people want to look at as well. Um, it'll help farm efficiency and it'll help improve uh, flood management. But the problem that we've got is that the sensors out there to the point that was just made in the previous discussion and yourselves, the sensors out there for this sort of thing are actually very expensive. You can take one sensor, it'll cost you about a thousand pounds to get one set of data points for soil moisture in the field. Therefore, those sensors don't get used in large IoT networks. They only actually get used by soil scientists and guys from EA that go out in the van, they monitor it on a daily basis manually, and they come back to the lab with the data. There's no real time. It's too expensive. So we've started looking at how we develop a sensor that's 10 times cheaper than that. And to the point, 
cheap sensors? No, sometimes you can make cheap sensors and still get high quality data, and that's what we're aiming at. And I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards about how we're doing that. It's probably a bit more than this talk can actually uh, really contain. So what we're basically looking at developing is, is a network where we've got a sensor placement out in the, in the, the key areas. Uh, we're putting these sensors in the ground, they're gathering the soil moisture data. I think that's fairly obvious from the discussions we've had so far about the, the activity of that. And we're putting it together in a layered set of mapping with the ground data, the moisture map itself, and then the rainfall radar and the rainfall maps that are coming to generate this kind of layered approach, which gives us a real world view of what the risk is to flooding and not just for the next 24 hours. What we want to do is do it for the next five to seven days and produce that quality of data. That gives people time to do things like closing a car park that they know is going to flood at the end of the week and saving some of that portion of 38 million that gets wasted. So what we're doing right now is we're taking our, our, our sensor design and we've started trials with Ferroscience and we've started some trials with a group a smart farming community called Precision Decisions who've been kind enough to say, come and put these in our fields. And Ferro Science has said, yeah, come and put these on our test sites because they like the way the stuff performs. They like the data that's coming off it. And above all, they like that cost point that means that we can actually, at last, generate a large area network of soil moisture that we can feed into the EA and give them that ground tooth information that they need. But we can also give the farming community the information that they need to improve their farming techniques and just produce better quality crops. That's basically what we're doing. I'm happy to talk any more to anybody who wants to do a bit more information about it, talk about the sensors, talk about the technology we're using to develop accurate, cheap sensors. Um, thanks very much for your time. Fantastic. Practical applications, cheap sensors cheap or sensors. indicators, we love that. <laughs> Is it? on, off, or a little bit in between. That's good. Um, great, so questions. Where do you buy them? How do we hire you? All that well, sort of thing. Can we talk to us afterwards? Great yeah, stuff. We'll give you all so the information. you're here all day. Great. Main question is when's lunch, I think. Really. Right, yeah. So if you're staying for the challenge, you get lunch. If you're not, you don't. <laughs> that's, uh, um, that's what's happening. So uh, who's last up? We're here. <laughs> So just, just so everyone knows, if, if you're here for the Challenger event and being involved in that, uh, we're going to look after you and give you some lunch. Otherwise, it's on your way and there's plenty of you into lead city centres, lots of places out there. If you want to go to the market, that's where I would go if I was you. Great. Oh. Leonard's up next. Yes. Over to you. How do you use it? Oh, there we are. No, I'm using my Apple, right? Um, I'm Dr. Leonard Anderson. I'm the founder and CEO of Camuri. We're a small startup organization, obviously using IoT and data analytics for some quite specific purposes. Um, but, but the point I want to make, it's the data we're collecting, it's the action required is where we're trying to uh, get the benefits to society. And although we're currently um, depending on the health sector, where our key market area, the message is still the same, right? It's what you're going to do with the data. And I think in the, in the challenges that are coming along, there's the housing sector we want to work with as well. So action from data in a number of different areas. I'll be quite quick, um, very few words. The care pathways are important, right? What do people have around themselves, um, body sensors, temperature, um, uh, heart rate? Uh, ideally, we want the prevention market where we can collect data about people and what they normally do because that's the low cost solution, right? Is, is to be able to keep people fit and prevent damage. The high cost part of the, of the health service is when somebody does have a fall. For example, it costs billions, you're in hospital, and to take the point about Alex, about cost cases, there's got to be a business case. And one of the things is a day in hospital, right, can easily pay for one of our devices for a year, 
right? Discharge from hospital is important, and the reablement process that I'm sure a number of the councils have got, it's making sure that people can get back to health, right, before, um, uh, before going back to normal living and back to good well-being. So uh, action, we need to know what to do by collecting the data. Um, housing is another one. Uh, the area we've come across is there's a lot of costs involved in looking after social housing. I just pick one as an example, right? Uh, if you have to go and check for a void, it means visiting the site. It's a very costly visit. If you want to check a fire alarm and do that sort of thing, a lot of these things can now be done remotely with I.O devices. Um, <coughs> garbage collection is another one. Uh, why do you go to a property or an area where there's nothing to collect? Um, so um, do something early, you'll be able to reduce your cost. We're going to have a good benefits case. Um, what we have done, and I'll give you an example, we have put our sensors inside a power socket. So what we're doing is measuring motion. There's a motion sensor there, a good quality one from Panasonic. Temperature, uh, um, power supply. We've also got humidity. We've got a uh, temperature sensor. We could, we could alert if, if the temperatures are very high in a house. And because it's got a motion sensor, we can measure void. So it's a very simple product to understand. Uh, that, in fact, is a GSM product, because when we started, we weren't sure that we would have good enough LP1 network coverages. What we're planning to do is to convert this to LP1. So and the reason it's so large is because of the battery power. We've got a very powerful GSM uh, transmitter in there. Why are we going to... Sigfox, well, doesn't have to be Sigfox. There is our replacement um, pendant alarm. It's also a motion sensor, so we can actually detect when somebody isn't wearing their pendant alarm. It also happens to be waterproof, right? So you can put it under water, and it will probably still transmit quite easily. And we develop, well, we've got a, we've got a fire sensor, and we're developing other, other products. So those are our data collectors. What <coughs> the issue is, we're collecting far too much data. So these are typical of the sort of Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's far too difficult to analyze with the human eye, right? Uh, there, that's several. That's better? Yeah, okay. You, you cannot hope to analyze that. So what we do is our analytics engine um, converts that into, and I call it machine learning without any debate about it. So we can look at a number of properties where people are living. If it's a green day for a particular person, they're all right. Or the, the sensors on average are what is normally happening in a property. We give alerts if there's a big change from what people normally do. And uh, we're also able to send alarms with one of our button sensors and we reply within about 30 seconds. Uh, and this is your know, five to 10 year battery life. Um, and, and we're sending data, SMS, text, all the usual sort of things. We're only reporting changes from normal. Somebody can take some action. And this is typical of the app that we've got that shows the sensor readings. We've got motion, power usage, temperature, and mains power failure. So you can look at somebody's data and do the interpretation. You know, in this particular case, you can't see the details. It could be an indication of urinary tract um, uh, 
UTI, <laughs> inflammation, I think it is, dehydration, hypothermia. So a social care person or a, a medical person can come along, right, and help that person provide. Um, what we've got on offer, if anybody is involved in the challenge, is we've got one of our portable devices, right, and we can provide you with data, <laughs> if you so want, you can locate it anywhere inside the, the property. Um, and Russ, right, if you want a URL for that data, he, he knows what a URL is, whereas I don't. <laughs> Thank you. A real life application.